the part where you said that uh, people search for Trump and you guys pop up. We do, yeah. Of course, because I rant against him. And, well, <clears throat> Greg. Well, yeah, I mean. Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians for this week. I am your brave and valiant, yet handsome host, Chris Spangle, uh, coming to you from uh, the uh, Phyllis Klosinski Studios. This is, of course, We Are Libertarians. And to my right, as always, uh, yet not always in the room, is Greg Lenz. Chris, how are you, buddy? I'm glad you're alive. We'll get to that in just a yes, second, and I'll explain will. why. Uh, to his left is little Brett Bittner. To his left? To his right. Oh, okay. Yeah. To his left, philosophically. I'm, right, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm using a preschool uh, left and right. Got it. Okay. Brett, Brett Bittner, uh, currently the executive director of the Advocates for Self-Government. He's on the Indiana State Central Committee. He's on on the LNC as an alternate running for Region 3. So if you're going to Orlando, please vote for uh, little Brett Bittner. As long as you're in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, or Kentucky, I don't want any of the Chicago ballot stuffing. <laughs> uh, and please vote at your own pace. Uh, to his r- right, right is Crystal Gross. Crystal, how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? You gotta talk like, you gotta get real close to that baby. That's inappropriate. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want her close to babies. Uh, is it is it uh, safe to say is it is it is it appropriate to say that you two are an item? I don't know. I haven't really made that kind of a commitment I yet. Have, I have seen them together multiple times. I think they're an undocumented alien Hoosier couple. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we need a wall in Indiana. <laughs> oh, you and your wall. I think it just got ten feet taller. Thanks. <laughs> and, you're, and you're paying for it, Brett. <laughs> Uh, they have. They are uh, coupled. Uh, they are engaged in various levels of coupledom, <laughs> but not marriage. All right. Yes. And then uh, for the first time, yet a long time, probably the first libertarian that uh, that was an out libertarian that I met, Tim McGuire joins us. I have no responsibilities here whatsoever. <laughs> so say that again. Nobody could hear you. I. I I have no responsibilities here whatsoever, but thank you for bringing me on here, Chris. Well, Tim, like I said, I met Tim way back in 2007. He was running for at-large on the City County Council. I was at-large of the City County Council. I was actually going to bring this up, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I'm indirectly responsible for this podcast. You are, yeah, because Tim was the first person that uh, was in the Libertarian Party that I met. And I got to talking to him, and the Libertarian Party was really uh, essing a bag of D's. Uh, 2007, 2008, and uh, a whole bag of dicks. All right, and it was just I we, just we were doing our best. Come on, yeah, and you can take that out and hold it if, it, if that's a little more comfortable for your face. Uh, well, I, I do, I do like to hold things close to my mouth. Uh oh, what is that on your hand? Uh, you you don't need to pay attention to that. I I, I might be a member of a certain organization that might be. That, Sometimes accused of being secretive. I, I am a hooded the, key holder. The libertarian establishment. <laughs> the, this is the ring of the libertarian establishment. I've asked here. you not to wear that ring in public. I don't want people to know about us. See, Greg and I didn't wear ours. Well, you see, but how, but how are we going to grow the establishment if we don't recruit <laughs> and promote? We'll talk about that a little later. T- Tim is a Freemason. Uh, and I think yes. that's crap because as libertarians we believe you should pay for it yourself and not expect it to be free. Right. Well, you know, the, pay the, for your own damn mason. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. You see, the free is as in freedom. So we're, oh. we're, we're we're like the founders of the U.S., but you don't know that. Yeah. And pay, the pyramid builders. Yeah. yeah. Pay for your own damn wall, Mason. <laughs> uh, so t- so basically, in two thousand seven and two thousand eight, the libertarians. I really became a liber- uh, libertarian party person in two thousand and eight because Ron Paul really swayed me that way, and then these guys started working on me. And in two thousand eight, I just uh, you guys are missing all these opportunities. This is the time, man. Why are you not really being successful? And it was Tim who said. Well, we don't have an executive director. We don't have somebody in the office that's actually doing stuff. And well, Wasn't that a year where it was the most important election of our lifetime? It was. The greatest <laughs> political upset ever in the history of the world happened that year. Uh, and I wish I had been a part of it. And, and the great white hope, Bob Barr, was our presidential <laughs> candidate right? that year. Which I was really into because I was a Republican coming as a, into uh, libertarianism, and Bob Barr, to me, seemed like a really reasonable candidate, uh, as did little Brett Bittner. 
I mean, it seemed it like... It also <laughs> helped that his headquarters was less than a mile from our condo at the time. Right. And his everything was centered in Georgia for his campaign. Right. So, so Brett, if you have complaints about Bob Barr, then Brett is your man. Get a hold yes. of him. Yes, please. Please do, because I've not taken enough. I have complained time. many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In all fairness, though, you know, while he was our actual candidate, Brett, uh, Bob did not do us wrong. No. No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I've, I've certainly seen <clears throat> worse representatives. Yeah. There. I mean, before he was... Well, he he got a root! Sorry, I had something in my throat. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> did you say yeah. Alan Root? No, <laughs> no, I coughed. I before, but before Bob what was our candidate of... and after Bob was our candidate, he, he was atrocious. But... Big hunk of hair gel in my throat yeah. there. Uh, so... Yeah, so Tim is indirectly responsible. He's the one who kind of pushed me in that direction, helped me get that job. And uh, Tim, I, I talked recently about that first um, meeting in 2008. It was two weeks before the election or the week before the election, and it was a Marion County meeting, and it was like, oh, we've got these 15-yard signs for Marion County. What do we do? And it's like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Uh, so Tim and I plotted. He, he became the chair of the Marion County Party. Really turned it around, did a great job with it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, then, uh, I don't know if you ever ran again, but you really became uh, one of one of the go-to people in the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and eventually part of the cabal. Go-to person for... Uh, is for that been made of, has, has that been made official yet? Am I officially part of the cabal? I, mean, I, I feel like I'm like the cabal behind the cabal, really. Oh wow! I mean, you're not Ooh. inner circle cabal. Yeah, you're not Rutherford level cabal, but you're cabal. Okay, all right. So yeah. you're you're above Brett, Greg, and I at least. Wait yeah. a second! I'm the one that came up with the whole cabal thing. Just because you named it, just because you named it, it doesn't mean you're in it. <laughs> all right. I mean, I I just named it the Billionaires Club. I don't have a billion dollars. Tim right. Tim also. Uh, sent me the sweetest text message earlier. He said, uh, "So I'm really excited about this." I made that part up. <laughs> I really cannot wait to be on the podcast tonight. I made that part up, too. He said, w what would you like me to bring? Alcohol, food, or women? And I, because, Well, it could have been all three. It could have, but I, I just said, listen, bring the drink of your choice. Uh, I, have a, I have a lovely girlfriend, so no women. Uh, but Dear Leader accepts offerings, edible offerings, and not the kind you potheads. You eat. Well, I, I have. Whoa, there. I want to go on the record. Um, I am not a potheed. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm no just idea. saying that I appreciate you bringing deep dish pizza to Dear Leader. Well, I appreciate being allowed into the uh, the key holders meeting. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, well I, I mean, I, I figured you, you're right down here on the south side, which is, you know, where the beautiful Pizzeria Uno's is. You guys born here in Indiana don't know what good pizza is. Mm -hmm. I'm from Chicago. I figured I had to bring you some Chicago-style pizza, so you're welcome. Well, you're a mensch and a scholar. Um, <laughs> and not Jewish. <laughs> Crystal, you, uh, you, your claim to fame, you have more political experience than Hillary Clinton did. You didn't just attach yourself to a successful political man. You've actually done political work. You are, you are quite experienced in the ways of politics, are you not? I am, yes. All right, right into that microphone, right in. I am, yes. Uh, so, so you, you were you, off, what did you do for the Libertarian Party of Georgia? Um, I had a lot of different things that I did. To be honest with you, I like the worst case of ADD ever, and I don't even remember what my title was. <laughs> she was the um, operations director the for operations the Libertarian, director. Libertarian Party Thank of Georgia. Thank you very yes. much. That's uh, honest, multiple. I have no idea what I'm candidate man campaign manager. Multiple. Yeah. She when managed in the party. multiple campaigns. Yeah, she yeah. was the assistant campaign manager yeah. for the first uh, African American to appear on the general election ballot for governor in Georgia. That's true. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That was a very wow. that was a very fun campaign. Um, and she's won two campaigns. John Mons. Yes, yes, John Mons, our good buddy from yep. uh, Cairo, Georgia. Mm -hmm. They call it Cairo, not Cairo. It's Cairo. Yes, they sir. Do. Yes, it's very stupid. Almost Florida. Almost Florida. So an accomplished Politico in your own right. Uh, you were assistant cat herder, uh, assistant to the cat herder, Brett Bittner, and chief Brett Bittner herder. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, twice. That's she was that. the yeah. chief Brett Bittner herder twice. Uh, Brett, uh, how are things at the Advocates? What's awesome. going on there? Things are awesome. Um, we just hit 23 million takings of the world's smallest political quiz online uh, earlier this month. And... Uh, 
things could be better. What What is the world's smallest political quiz? Uh, the world's smallest political quiz is a 10 question self-assessment. It gives you an idea of where you fall um, with your political tendency. It's not telling you what you are necessarily, but where you tend to be. Um, the focus of it is accuracy rather than uh, some of the things that it has been accused of with regard to leading questions and things like that. Um, our focus really is to make sure that it is an accurate tool for political assessment. It's been included in textbooks, Washington Post, uh, Yahoo, back when they had a magazine featured uh, a story about it. We were on Stossel uh, about this time last year um, where he was grading some of the then presidential candidates. I don't think any of them other than Hillary Clinton um, are still really around, at least having a legitimate shot at uh, the presidency. Um, so yeah, the World's Smallest Political Quiz gives you an idea of where you fall. And it's a great outreach tool for people who are looking, who have a political mind, regardless of if you're a conservative group, if you're a, a liberal group, if you're a libertarian group, or you're just uh, like the League of Women Voters, completely nonpartisan, you just want people to be involved. It's a great place to see where people fall on the political spectrum. And, uh, and it's a great place to start your outreach. Yeah, so please check that out, theadvocates.org, theadvocates.org. Google it. <clears throat> yeah, definitely Google it. Google it'll, it. Are you guys, or just li Google Libertarian. It's right. third or fourth result. Do you guys endorse anybody in the Libertarian race? No, it is a, we are a completely nonpartisan education organization. Uh, so I've actually had multiple candidates recently, a wave, that have asked for... Uh, endorsements from us, and that's just not something that we do. Yeah. They, unlike we, Greg, are above the fray. And I, I gotta we say, are the fray. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the the ones that got famous from uh, the the songs on that show. Yeah, oh, no. uh, was it the OC? Have a bad day. Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. Grey's Anatomy. Yes, yeah. couldn't think of it. No, and I gotta Sorry. I gotta sing uh, Brett's praises uh, on this quiz because uh, I've you know worked uh, some booths at festivals for candidates and with candidates and. That quiz is a great um, way of weeding out the people that I should not bother talking to. Yep, I am. Uh, I score a twenty eighty. So that's about right. Uh, right yeah. in the libertarian quadrant. Uh, <laughs> I would just like to point out how exclusive that statement was, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you see, I'm I'm inclusive of the people who are libertarians. It's and about the use of resources. But, right. but if they score if they score a twenty twenty, I I don't have enough time to talk to them about why they're wrong. I can't convince Hitler to support Ron Paul. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, he boy. seems like a reasonable chap. I'm sure he had enough time. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and let me say that quiz is very generous as what as far as what it calls libertarian. And so thorough. Yes, that's true. And it's very thorough. <laughs> Greg, I I just have to say, Greg, uh, Greg is one of my best friends. I love him dearly. It's been such a great honor to to be co-host with him in this project because he and I have gotten to to get along, uh, to get to know each other much better. I uh, trust him. Uh, Almost like a brother. I'd say that almost because, you know, we never like, we never shared blood. I don't like family. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a voluntary choice of family. I'd which say is a higher. I'd say just kidding, but I know my family doesn't listen because they don't support anything I do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you don't like them. Right? Right. <laughs> so, so I woke up this morning completely dismayed. <laughs> I was so heartbroken this morning. I I woke up almost in tears because I killed Greg in my dream last night. I don't. I, I didn't kill. He murdered me. No, Hashtag so, R.I.P. Greg Lynch. Yeah. We'll miss you, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know they say the Native Americans say that if you dream about something, that means you need to make it come true. Well, That's true. <laughs> I'm not making this one come true because Greg went down to IU, a, a, a university an hour away from here, Bloomington, and uh, Greg was. So savagely anally <laughs> raped that oh he ended up dying, and, and he passed away from his energy I, I, uh, injuries. Uh, I, I guess it was excessive anal Internal. bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> oh my! I wish any of that were a joke. I don't know what that says about me, but uh, and this was definitely not a wet dream. No. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. No. No. Uh, and so, I, I listen, when someone is uh, attacked at IU, I immediately look to Tyler Weiss. Me too. Wonder, wonder what he's up to. Long track record. Yep. Bring her back. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and hashtag bring Spear back. We've talked about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and so Greg, uh, Greg had the funeral of the century. I will say Greg is a very popular fellow, apparently, because he had stadium seating for his funeral. I'm honored. I would never have imagined that. I thought it would have been about four chairs and, you know, maybe one would be open. No, your family didn't show up, but uh, <laughs> everybody else was sad. Which I find hard to believe because they are fantastic. Yeah, they are they're not very nice people. But uh, Will Newkirk, Matt Riddle, they showed up. Great people. Great Plainfield gentlemen. <laughs> A lot of high school friends showed up. Was Brian Kill there? Uh, yes. My, my, <laughs> he sent flowers. <laughs> All right. Good. My new boss was there. He showed up. He oh, just wow. came to pay his respects and started talking to me about social media strategy. And I was like, <laughs> now is not the time. <laughs> so, but you had a great spread at your funeral. You had, a, you had a lot of fruit and vegetable trays. Nice. I was at, while I was talking social media strategy with my boss, I was eating cauliflower and ranch. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, so it was, the, it was at a, an emerging mega church. Oh man! So that's how big this was, and I was in a separate little room, and I just kept breaking down, crying because I was very sad. I cried all through this dream several times. I cried over you dying, and at one point I thought, "How can I ever do the podcast without Greg? How will I ever tell the listeners of his death?" Uh, Again, wait, was it a, again? Was it enough, so much crying that you had a nosebleed. Yes. That's when you know. Oh, oh wow. my. Oh, God. When wow. I, and when I weep, I weep, and my, no, my nose bleeds. <laughs> Emily and I broke up uh, recently, and I ruined a mattress pad with blood. I, it just was it The pictures out. are fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And so I was just very sad, and uh, I decided the way to tell the listeners that you had, had actually died for real this time was through a meme. <laughs> so, of course. Why, how, was there any other way? No. Yeah. And so... Uh, we, I shared the meme of you where your face is coming out of heaven and you're Make America Great Again hat. Uh, make we, memes great we'll, again. We'll, I'll, I'll make sure to put it, uh, put it in the, uh, if you go to weirdlibertarians.com and look for this episode, you'll see the photo. Um, your casket that your family chose was a little weird. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> I, this is a bit off-putting to me. Yeah, so, so... his family chose the casket but didn't show up to the funeral. They were too... The casket <laughs> is pretty loose interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> the rumor that I heard was that they were too upset to come to the wedding. So, you know... The <laughs> wedding. <laughs> All right. It was a funeral. Same thing. Right. Freudian slip. And so... I, I went out to, to observe your body coming out of the hearse... And uh, I was very upset. This was a very emotional moment until I started laughing. And it was because your family had chosen a suitcase. Uh, <laughs> they, was it leather? It was a leather, like, okay. tan, bra- a tan leather suitcase looking thing. It was like it's they got had handles, so it's convenient. It's classy. Well, yeah. they had built, like, a, a platform, and then they had wrapped you in this tan leather, and you could see the outline of, like, your face <laughs> and your body. Like the Shroud of Turin? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. And so they carried you inside, and then they push you on stage, and then there was a whole production, and and the preacher started talking like in, in tongues, and then there was fireworks and music, and they were like web, they were web streaming it. They, Aaron Ewart was was periscoping my funeral. It was <laughs> it was the most ridiculous. It wasn't even a funeral. It was just like. We decided to have an emerging church service with acrobats and like magicians to, to bring, because we've got all these people in the church, we need to do outreach to them. What's going to grab their attention? Obviously magicians. What a waste of funeral. Right. right. <laughs> you have the audience. Yeah. And, and the crowd was loving it. They were laughing the whole time. I mean, there were a few. Tears. That's how I want to go out, right? <laughs> they were they, they were showing your memes on on a projector. <laughs> oh my God. So like some of them like you no know, real life pictures, just memes. I'm a huge <laughs> f. Please write my face. Man. They even showed that one, but it's an emerging church, so it was okay. Yeah, yeah it's progressive. It's, it's progressive. It's, it's, progressive. Wow. it's a it's they're a secret church. Wait, a secret did, friendly church. Does the preacher there wear jeans? That's how emerging <laughs> yeah. and no, they are. No, the preacher was actually the preacher from Hannah's wedding. Who, who was in his 70s. Yeah, it looked, was very establishment. Looked like a, looked like <laughs> a se- yeah. kind of like a 70-year-old Barney Fife. Yeah. Uh, real good dude. But, yeah. you know, it had like a white beard and white hair. But he was definitely like dressed like that, trying to look hip for the kids. And it was a Baptist church, which was funny. It was like a Southern Baptist church. An emerging mega <laughs> Southern, Southern Baptist, Baptist church. church. Okay. Right. And I just were you? Did you have Joel Osteen, Osteen on while you were sleeping? No, I, and and it was out like in Amo, where where we grew up. We yeah. grew up in Plainfield, like forty five minutes west in the uh, in the county. It was Amo, so it was like way out in the country. But it was this enormous like, 
And it was like kind of a small church building, but when you walked inside, it was a stadium. So that is, I your, mean, your vivid family, imagery. Your family. Vivid imagery. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever had a dream Me with this many details it was, that I remember. It was so weird because I woke up and I remembered every single... I immediately started typing it out to, to a couple groups because I knew if I typed it out, I could I could remember it. Yeah. I remember watching... Um, gosh, who was there? It was Matt Gillette's dad, who's like this real, you know... Oh uh, well, you need guns, and you need you know. <laughs> listen, you just need to you just need to have sex with her. One of, you know, one of those old time guys, and and he was talking to Arnold Schwarzenegger. So you got the, Arnold. Wow. Yeah, wow. you have the governor at your way. That's fantastic. That means he's a libertarian. He, he's he's man <laughs> the memes. So, yeah. So, I promise you're gonna get a good send off when you finally uh, go. But I won't hold you to it. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't do expect it. acrobats, or you don't have to build an emerging church or to organize <laughs> such a production, but just have the memes scrolling. <laughs> Actually, just make my casket sitting up in a digital screen and just memes <laughs> rolling over it where my face would be. And, you know, I'm sorry about anally raping you to death in my dream. Well, it wasn't you, so... I didn't do it. Yeah, I, it's you know, somebody. Blame those liberal women types. probably Tyler. It, 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 right now in my brain, I'm getting a, vin- a vision of Vincent D'Onofrio and Men in Black where he's like the he takes the fly's body and he's like oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah like a real truck driver oh, this sounds really got. bad yeah. <laughs> so you got this doesn't sound pleasant at all you got butt raped by an alien to death <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just a probing they killed you oh well at least it'd make news I yeah guess. so congratulations thank you i'm still here <laughs> i mean still you, here. you've made it i i woke up i was literally just sad and like is greg alive and like i scrolled through and i saw you were in chats at, like, the night before i was like okay good he's alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wait wait you woke up and thought maybe he had actually been raped to death but maybe i mean he's a handsome man <laughs> weirder things happen in libertarian circles <laughs> i mean i'm just oh, saying boy. uh okay so Hey, as always, uh, we are so thankful. We are listener supported uh, by people like you. And since our last episode, our last episode was uh, pretty heavy. It was episode one forty four, Amanda's story, and it basically uh, Greg couldn't get all the way through it. No, it was just gonna ruin his day. But Greg knows a lot of the story, and she's you know an, a wonderful individual. And it's just it, unfortunately, it's the common story of. A state that is intended to protect and do good things, and it's seemingly only possible the opposite. Yeah. And it just is so frustrating when it, when it's someone you know and you know you're helpless. So episode 91 and episode 144, those are two, two episodes where we have found people that just life happens and because of perverse incentives, bad things happen at, at, in life. And then the government, because of those perverse incentives, have made it worse, similar to making a murder. So... If you're you're into making murder, I've gotten a lot of good mail, and and this is kind of the most rewarding, uh, exciting mail that I've ever had since we've launched this. A couple of men, I've only had mail from men, mm-hmm. which makes sense because our listeners our listeners are like sixty seventy five percent guys, mm-hmm. according to Facebook. Um, I mean libertarians, right? <laughs> and I have received two or three emails uh, from guys who just said, I never really thought about domestic violence, and I never really thought about my own controlling tendencies, and that changed my whole perception of what women who are abused go through, and it made me a better partner. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, like, just gives me, it gave me goosebumps when I read it. It just was really, uh, those were great notes to receive. I know I've gotten a few, few notes to Amanda and her family just saying, hey, we're praying for you, I've sent those along. And uh, she would like to express her thanks. It, it listen. It's a difficult listen, and it's it, we are all about uh, presenting uh, the pol- reality. Pol- we're all we're all about politics in a fun and intelligent way here on We Are Libertarians, and we're real people who just do this real thing. But real life sometimes is scary and sucks. And uh, if you're not going to hear the truth from us, then I don't know where you're going to hear it. So, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that it takes horrific events like this to even move the needle to right. get people to look at what actually goes on. Because it's always, you know, when you see, even there's a recent local story with a um, in Owen County, Indiana, where an individual raped his own daughter and murdered her. And she was 18, oh, yeah. 15, 18 months yeah. old. Yeah. 
Right. Oh, yeah, the, the recent story. Yeah, yeah. he was and, just arrested. For yeah, it. he was just arrested. And, you know, even then when it's just on the news, it's just, and that's a horrific story that's really hit, I think, anyone that's seen it in the gut. This, because you know him, and you went, you know, yeah, is just so much more like, ah, oh, I just, you know, I want to be B for Vendetta, but I know that's counterproductive. You know, you it, it brings out the anger in me at the state, and I know, you know, you have to restrain that and say, what are the most effective ways I can deal with this and help? Trust me. Uh, trust me. I mean, having grown so close to them that they've become family, uh, it's it's been incredibly hard to watch and live with and be around over the last two years. And I'll tell you, it is a huge, huge reason I have become more and more anarchist. Uh, and I just think if you listen to that, you go, uh, all right, I just moved the libertarian needle about three more points mm-hmm. because it's just so powerful and... Uh, her story is 100% true. I mean, yeah. I, I wish there were any part of it that weren't, but I've personally watched it, and and it just, it's, it's, it's devastating. Well, anytime you give, you know, a group of people, government especially, just unchecked power where, you know, we, we respect them and we, we, you know, feel for, like, the danger they put themselves in every day, that we just, we just turn a blind eye and say, well, you know, you felt threatened, so it's okay that you shot that kid. Um, you, you have license to. Yeah, on you our have behalf. license to on our behalf because we're afraid to do their job for them. So we're afraid to call them out when they do. Uh, and so yeah, they they have unchecked you know power to do whatever they want, and they know that most Americans are not going to call them out on it. Yeah. So, no, most of them will give them a hero's uh, welcome. Most people don't want to listen to that last episode because it's ugly. It's too difficult to hear. But those are the exact... That's why you should listen. Mm -hmm. That's why you should take the three hours and listen to it. Because you need to hear that police officers respond to a woman who is a victim of domestic violence and won't take a police report, but they will ask for her phone number. Mm -hmm. They will say, shake your boobs at him next time so we can catch him. They... they, uh, You... You need to hear that it takes going to the media to finally get a prosecutor to take you seriously. You need to hear that despite multiple reports from... A um, long criminal background? A, a, a long... Uh, multiple recommendations that the ex shouldn't see the child. He gets half and half custody. 50-50 custody because a judge just didn't read things. You need to hear that despite multiple, maybe a dozen reports to DCS from a dozen different people, including myself, saying there's something wrong here with the relationship between father and daughter, and nothing's been done about it. You need to hear that that is the system that your taxpayers are going to pay for. You need to hear that your dollars are being spent on that inefficient of a government, and that inefficiency hurts and ruins lives. And yes... It starts with personal choice, and we spend a lot of time talking in that episode about what are the warning signs? How do you personally get out of it after you've made a bad choice? Because there is personal responsibility. But at the end of the day, when you are a person who, like Amanda, was a a child of a military family, a father fought in a a war for this country um, on multiple tours, uh, a stunning amount of tours in in one war, uh, you... She's a Democrat, somebody who believes the lie that the the government is going to protect you, that they're going to be there to protect you. And that, you know, the answer is not, you know, government created the problem and all we need is more of it to fix it. Right. Well, and, it, you know, you take a look at the way that people are viewing the government intervention and it, it's all about intent versus outcome. We've talked about that before where mm-hmm. we, we want to have somebody that's an arbiter that can, that can be there to protect life, liberty, and property and we continue to grow their ability to do that and instead they they focus on other things and and they they cherry pick what they go after you know you take a look uh, at the, at crime stats from 100 years ago and compare them to now and and you see where law enforcement's focus has moved and we think that they're there to serve and protect that's what we've all been brought up to believe it's what we see. It's what Hollywood tries to reinforce, for the most part, and unless they're, you know, extenuating circumstances where they're showing the bad guys behind the badge. But uh, it, we aren't seeing the outcomes that we intend to have uh, when we empower them to do so. And you're exactly right. When we're spending tax dollars on intent, 
and we're spending tax dollars on what we want to happen, um, but we aren't actually getting what we're paying for. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably the most frustrating part, I think, um, in, in the stories like the last episode. Um, the stories like when we talked about the Averys and making a murderer, yeah. this you know where the state has failed. Um, we we want the good intentions. We we want to feel good about what we are tasking government to do, and they continue to fail uh, on almost every level because they can't reach those outcomes that we desire. Right. And the system, you know, every system is imperfect because it all has flaws. But the system we have is a bureaucracy designed to improve the lives of the people that vote them into power, but the mismatch is that it's people who are voted into power are most, they, they win via politics, mm -hmm. and politics doesn't translate over into bureaucratic success and the ability to do something well. It gives them an incentive to promote the horrors by the voters that put them into office, you know, victimize them, get everybody to coalesce around putting more of these monsters when, the, you know, a lot of times the monster is actually within the bureaucracy. But that never makes it on the front page of the Indy Star or USA Today. And, and to a certain extent, to put the burden back on all of us a little bit, uh, we as a society have just l said, well, we, I don't need to worry about, um, <laughs> you know, people like this because, well, the police will take care of it. You That's know, what my tax I, 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 I don't, you know, if I hear my neighbor screaming next door, I, I don't need to go over and make sure everything's okay. I just call the police because that's well, where my tax dollars go. Because for. we've outsourced the responsibility. Because we've outsourced, yeah, absolutely. To our community. Yeah, and so I mean, and I've had you know an awakening in the last couple of years. Just uh, there's a couple of women in my life that started being very frank with me and saying, yeah, I, they I get a lot of harassment every day, all the time, and and I, I went from like, well, you know, I'm sure that happens once in a while. You know, how heck, even I get. Harass Run along, once in a while. Talk. Chop, yeah, chop. yeah. But, but when, once they once I started hearing it from multiple women, it was like, no, there's these guys out there. They wait until the rest of us aren't looking, and, and they pull this shit. Excuse my. That's language. okay. No, that's, yeah, you're great. We're, we're trying but, not to curse, but it happens. Yeah, but uh, you know, so I mean, I think I think it's uh, I think all of us have a response, shared responsibility. Uh, you know, the people who are receiving the harassment need to speak up and, and tell everybody what's going on, uh, like your friend did. And uh, and the rest of us need to respond and not just let not just rely on government to fix all our problems for us. Yeah. yeah, not once we hear it say, "Well, government, do this, fix this for her." Yeah, <laughs> even though you just right. caused it, fix uh, it. I can tell you. I mean, my my girlfriend is twenty. I say that not to brag. Uh, I say that because <laughs> interestingly, he says it every episode. Every episode, she's incredibly beautiful. I do say that to brag, um, but. She is, uh, she's just of a generation different than I think any of the rest of us are in, where she grew up. I mean, we had this conversation this weekend about her high school and middle school experience where they had cell phones, they had camera phones, they had video phones. Like, we didn't have that when we were in high school. Right, so senior year, it was like the Nokia change cover. Right. Like the phone, you remember those Nokias oh, you yeah. get, yeah. like the Georgia Bulldogs yeah. cover oh, for? Yeah. I had yeah. the block Nokia phone that took down the Twin Towers. Yeah. <laughs> so, and she had Snapchat, mm -hmm. you know, and so she was just kind of walking me through it, but I can tell you, on a daily basis, there are multiple messages from guys, even though we are very open and proud and loving about our relationship on, on Facebook. Much very open, much and proud. to everyone's chagrin. <laughs> yes. No, it's it's encouraged because it's just more content. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is a lot of fun to poke at. Oh I, yeah. I just looked at her today and I just said, "Listen, what does it feel like to be everyone's favorite celebrity couple on Facebook, honey?" Spewly. <laughs> Spewly. Oh yeah. And I I just I go I she just shows me some of these messages. It's multiple people a day just sending her awful awful things. Like they know, like your disgusting perverted message is going to make her go. You know what? <laughs> Even though I'm in love with Chris Spangle, and I really, I mean, wouldn't be right. But I'm gonna go ahead and dump him for the guy who just sent me my tenth dick shot for the day. Like it just it's, it's it, it sounds like the experience I've heard country. that women have on uh, OK Cupid. Yeah, as right. well. Yeah. Right. Dating is a nightmare. We have a mutual friend that just got on Tinder. I can't wait oh after 24 hours to get with her and see. All the, all the pain that she's getting. And who we know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you. If you listen to that, please share it. Uh, you know, it is a story that I've really wanted to tell for two years. And I was really surprised when she said she was ready to tell it. And I am really surprised with the openness that, that she had in telling it. 
she didn't leave a thing out. There were certain parts, you know, that I just thought she wasn't going to talk about. And she talked about everything. She just told the naked true story. And when somebody is that vulnerable and that open and that honest and just raw, I mean, it just, it's, it was tough for both of us that day to, to record it. Um, but she just really wanted to put that out there so people understand what it's like to be a, vi a victim of domestic violence, how to avoid being a victim of domestic violence, how to get out of a bad situation if you're in it, persuade men to treat women better, and uh, to talk about the, you know, here's a, 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 an Obama, proud Obama voter that's basically calling for armed revolution by the end of this podcast just because she has so been abused by the system. She's been abused twice. Uh, so it's just a really powerful story. It's a really powerful episode. Please take a listen and share it. And one thing I wanted to say is if you're out there and like, you know, we can't do a podcast with absolutely everybody, but if you want to write under a pseudonym or you want to message, you know, your experiences or something you've had, we'd love to promote it as content on the, on the website as a yeah. blog post, or even if you want to do it where you don't use your name at all and record it, you know, via audio, and then we can put it out as a special little segment. We'd be more than happy to once you listen to it. Uh, and, and I would even be open if you're here in the Indy area or within driving distance and you want to come and do a similar episode. We want to, we want to hear your stories. I, it, I just, I think the foundation of the human experience is storytelling, and we need interpersonal communication and storytelling as much as we need food and water. And libertarians, by and large, don't tell stories. They tell you facts, and here's the logical reasons that you're supposed to not like the government. And that just doesn't, it doesn't connect. Sell. It doesn't connect with a lot of people. People need to hear stories. And so, if you have a story to tell, this is why we have built this platform. We want to help you tell it. Uh, so, feel free to email me at editor at wearelibertarians.com send to Greg or I a Facebook message uh, whatever we're, we're here to help I, I want to help tell your story because we want to make a difference with with what we're doing here and uh, we got several notes one person Michael Christensen ha uh, actually became a donor to the podcast uh, he started donating to we are libertarians as a result of that we are listener supported, uh, so we are we are relying on you to help offset the cost of doing We Are Libertarians from here on out. Uh, and many of you have responded by going to WeAreLibertarians.com, donating via PayPal, donating via Patreon, and we want to thank you guys. Uh, we want to thank Sam Naimi. Uh, I promise to butcher all your names. That's one of the guarantees. <laughs> Not only do you get it's a sign of affection. Not only do you get the free podcast uh, every week, you also get me butchering your names if you donate. And we're working on some special uh, prizes and other things for those of you who have gone out of your way. And uh, I just appreciate everybody who has made that effort. It's just so encouraging. And even if you can't maybe you know contribute financially and you do like a particular episode we do, we always accept payment in via of shared social just media and tag us. And the, we'll you know, yeah. be happy to promote it any way we can. It costs nothing for you to, to share our webpage, say, hey, check these guys out. You know, we have everything, we have everything you need to become a libertarian. Uh, you know, we've got links to the quiz. We've got yep. we've got the path to libertarianism. We've got libertarian activism uh, training on our website. We've got a lot, uh, and you guys do a lot to support us, and we want to support you. And we're we're working on a few ideas to to make this even bigger and better. And to it make is, it great again. And make it great again because <laughs> it, and it is solely because of the the generosity of our listeners. So Sam Naimi, Michael Christensen, Dennis Binington. Uh, Chris Lane and our dear, dear parallel Mexican friend Joe Ruiz. Uh, thank you all for contributing since the last time you were here. Uh, and Jeremiah Morrill. Uh, Jeremiah Morrill. Nice. The uh, man. The man, the myth, the legend. Donated seven dollars, and he will be contributing seven dollars every month. How how much is that in Canadian dollars, Chris? That is enough to buy pizza on the south side of Indianapolis. So <laughs> he's subsidizing. You buying him his own pizza? Right. He is sending me nice. $7 so that when we go out to, to dinner, I can then hand him that $7 <laughs> so he can buy the balance of the pizza. Uh, so, <laughs> What a minch. Thank you to Jeremiah Morrill for launching the uh, our first donor level at $7 a month. Uh, you too, for $7 a month via PayPal, can become a member of the Jeremiah Morrill Pizza Society. So please go to WeAreLibertarians.com. So... Thanks to him. Uh, we got a note, and again, we, we want to make this interactive. We want to communicate both ways with our listeners, because that's, that's been a lot of the fun over doing this the last couple of years, and especially over the last, like, it feels like the last three months, 
There's, it's it, maybe it's because I'm paying attention again, and I'm just noticing what you've probably seen for three years, Greg. That people are really interacting with us a lot. They're talking. They are. And they're, 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 yeah, they, you know, they uh, they. I for whatever reason get a lot of individual messages, but um, you know, it's it's been awesome because they've become everybody's become a friend. Yeah. You know, everybody involved, everyone, and that you know, it's even fun. Even to, Ryan Ripley. Yeah, even Ryan <laughs> Ripley. You know. I, I, I love Ripley. I do too. I love Ripley. He's, uh, he's great. I mean, he's a wonderful representative of the party, and he's been involved. And uh, I know with his new career, he hasn't been able to be involved as much as he used to. But you know, just getting—I'd have never met any of you, and I'd never met Brett if it wasn't for this podcast or Tim. Because Tim, for me, I my exposure to the LP before you guys got here was Maya. Oh boy! <laughs> and Maya won an award for the Libertarian Party the year wow. that my first exposure. What was yeah. that for? Uh, activism? Uh, activism, yeah, and wow. it's and it was true, like it was earned, and it, she deserved it completely. It was well, yeah. that was 2012, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. but then at a convention, I was introduced to Tim and Mark Rutherford, and prior to that, I've been like, I just don't see this growing because I don't see I don't see the people that can go out and fundraise. You know what I mean? Right. And I I didn't have exposure to the infrastructure on the inside, yeah. and I met Tim and I met Mark, and I was like, oh, it's all here. Yeah, you know it's yeah. there. These are great guys. Like they're credible. We're, they're we're putting just, plans together. We're just a little too busy to come on a podcast all the time. No, yeah, no. And like we <laughs> get, sorry, and, and you know, you may not have wanted to. You know, like so. Or but, you may not have been invited, Tim. <laughs> but now that you brought pizza, I'm like, back. I'm like yeah. a cat. It's like Maslow's dog or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. Pavlov's dog. Yeah, Pavlov's dog. Ring the bell. Yeah, right. Ring pizza, and you're on the podcast. Right. I told uh, you before. Remember when we like we had all kinds of people come in. Uh, a guy br- brought early on this, and I I didn't know any of these people yet. And a guy made enchiladas at home. Oh, Neither of us knew him. He had like a loose contact to Chris Gall. And he just <laughs> he just randomly showed up and brought uh, enchiladas, and I was like, this is the craziest shit I've ever seen. Josh <laughs> Josh River Breyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he brought an enchilada bake. Yeah, great guy. Yeah. Great guy. Turns out, great guy. Yeah, great he, enchiladas and everything. None of us got diarrhea. We didn't die. No, no. You lost. Your wife left, but that wasn't because of the enchiladas. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great side it, it, it was. Uh, if I ever get married again, bring me those enchiladas again, Brett. <laughs> but you know, and that why we talked about this and brought this up was, and this is why Brett, Crystal, and Tim are here. Well, hold on, I want to I want to read this uh, letter first. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, is but, it not related to the? It it all fits. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the the infighting in just a minute. But another one of our great listeners. So, bottom line, we want to hear from you. Please send us emails. Please send us Facebook messages. We want to hear. Hey. I have a question about libertarianism that I need answered. I'm confused. Uh, I want to be a libertarian, but this one issue is stumping me. Hey, I listen to the podcast. I love you guys. You guys did X for me. If we motivated you, if you became a libertarian, if you had something happen because of this podcast, or if you just want to write in and say hi, but uh, please send us emails, editor at wearelibertarians.com. Send us Facebook messages on the page or at our personal you're allowed to, to... Can we call you on your cell phone and just breathe heavily? That is the one thing, if you're female, that is the one thing you're not allowed to do, and I'd ask you to please stop, Crystal. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Vanessa Holdcamp, which is actually somebody that uh, we went to high school with. I was on newspaper with her. She, I think she was on yearbook, uh, but I knew her in publications, and she just started listening to the podcast because two of her high school friends started a podcast, and uh, we'll hear the result. Vanessa writes, I am a small business owner, so I support a flat tax in abolishing the IRS. Our current setup makes continuing business and hiring employees very difficult. I support religious freedom. You should not be forced to do anything you don't want to, especially in the private business sector. While I would gladly bake a cake for a gay marriage, no one should force the Jewish butcher to sell pork. I think we need immigration reform. There are not perks for the people who do things legally versus illegally. Here in California, we get driver's licenses to both. I support life. I think all lives are equal and important. I think we should not be concerned for only for abortions, but for the mother as well. If we had more support for women who need it, abortion rates might drop. Bottom line, people, both big and small, are important. I feel entirely betrayed by GOP candidates. I don't know how else to say it because I do not, I, I feel so deeply and strongly. The same people who said they are not against illegal, or against immigration, but against illegal immigration are now at the forefront saying that we need to close all the borders and keep refugees from legally entering the United States. Which is interesting. Four years ago, the tone was, how do we get them visas the right way? Now it's like, build a wall. 
Uh, the same people who uh, screamed for religious freedom are now saying we should only allow Christian refugees and not allow more Muslim influence. The same people who protested pro-life and all lives matter are now saying that only American lives matter and we shouldn't get our hands dirty. Now on their sponsored and paid for social media ads, they are using fear tactics to get attention of votes. Vote for me and I'll protect you when in reality, a vote for me, I'll let them die. Looking at recent posts for We Are Libertarians, I think I'm not alone in, in feeling this way. Is there anyone, any candidate who makes sense anymore? Is there any hope? Is there anyone who is not selling out at this opportunity to, for, to use fear for more votes? I feel lost. I feel hopeless, and my heart cries out for those who need America the most. Is there any insight or advice that you have? Any political hope before I recklessly say, screw this, burn it all to the ground, V-E-R-N? I could really use some right now, uh, Vanessa, and uh, she wrote this back in uh, a while ago, so but so she's kind of fallen further down the We Are Libertarians rabbit hole, and she just wrote this. I'm glad I found Wall and the Libertarian Party. I enjoy the podcast and hearing a rational point of view, except when Brad's on. Nice to have another opinion <laughs> than the extremes the two parties have turned into. Thank you for giving me hope in this crazy media circus. So I pose the question uh, to to you, uh, gentlemen and lady. Uh, is there any hope? Are there any candidates who make any sense more? Uh, help this poor uh, poor woman who feels lost and betrayed by her party. I would say watch Stossel tomorrow night. You're going to see three very good representatives of people who are authentic and honest, uh, who are talking about the issues that actually matter to us rather than the ones that they can fundraise from. Whether, rather than, you know, those those issues that they have made pet issues and wedge issues so that they can continue their power and influence. Uh, the gentlemen that will be on uh, are actually in it for you and I. Mm -hmm. um, they aren't worried about raising millions and millions and millions of dollars and having huge staffs and opening offices in state after state after state. These are guys that are really in it for... Uh, for America, and and I, I applaud uh, Stossel for hosting uh, the first libertarian presidential debate in in history that'll be televised nationally. Um, you'll have Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico. Uh, you'll have John McAfee, the uh, antivirus software guy, who's um, become more and more of a, a household name as he's he's kind of jumped in with the whole Apple versus the FBI deal. Um, and you'll have a former uh, Libertarian Party staffer. Uh, who has returned to the party uh, in Austin Peterson and and those three gentlemen are going to be there and and they do I've I've seen them I've met them all uh, except for John I did I was uh, when I was in Colorado he had uh, somebody that was there as a surrogate for him who's a friend of ours Chris Thrasher uh, oh. who's managing his wow. campaign yeah and nice. uh, who his campaign manager Chris <clears throat> is a guy that I like and trust and. If he's managing his campaign, then I, I do believe that's a, a point for John McAfee. It, yeah, it, yeah. it gives him some cred, yeah. Yeah. for sure. Um, and so those three gentlemen will be on the Sossel Show. Uh, that's Friday, April the 1st. If you guys aren't listening to it, you know, Friday, April the 1st, when it's posted, um, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Sossel and rerun multiple times. And I understand that next week's episode on the 8th will be the second hour that they recorded. Mm. Um, so they did a two-hour debate, and it's going to be split up into two episodes. So it's a hundred, or uh, instead of one hundred twenty minutes, it'd be about ninety. Yeah. When you take into account commercials and whatnot. But I, I will say, a lot of people probably are going to miss those two uh, pieces. But we will. For... That's okay. Stossel runs like six yep. times on the weekend. Yeah. On Fox Fox he's this beautiful because he he's on his reruns when libertarians are awake at like three in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like red eye. It's yeah, awesome. It we will. Uh, so you can also see it on Hulu or Fox Business's website. Look for Stossel, or you can uh, and we'll make sure to put it up on the front page of WeAreLibertarians.com and put the audio of those two debates in the Raw Audio Politics podcast feed. So check that out. And if you want to hear the Libertarian Party mini on the gubernatorial debates, if you're a Hoosier, then check that out too. Uh, we have a contested race here. So, and yeah. I think it's important to point out to anyone who might not be a party member, uh, if they're worried about ballot, you know, if the Libertarians are going to be on the ballot. I mean, we're, we're on the ballot in Indiana, and we'll be on the ballot in uh, probably all 50 states. In the past, it's been really close, like 48 well, the, states. The toughest has been Oklahoma this year. Yeah. Oklahoma will be. They're recognized by the uh, the state 
okay, in Oklahoma great. as a political party for this election. But e even if it's not 100%, I mean, it'll be enough to gather, you know, to mathematically be able to gather enough electoral votes. We, we you know, do have a shot. Yeah, even though, and I'm trying to do this with mittens kissing my face, but uh, even though I have personally poked at Austin Peterson a little bit, I think that he would uh, he, he would be a better president than Donald Trump, than Ted Cruz, <laughs> than Hillary Clinton. So so yeah, I think you sure. you should check out the Libertarian Party candidates. Uh, the guy that I like is Gary Johnson, but you may like uh, John McAfee or uh, Austin Peterson. Go to iSideWith.com or Daryl Perry. You may be into Daryl Perry too. Uh, Mark Ellen Feldman. There. You may multiple. not be into him. Well, there no there there are I think twelve candidates yeah. that have qualified that are on LP.org um, as candidates that have met whatever criteria were set. Right. Um, so it's John not just Gilmore's those three. Of the, of the LP. Well, you know, it's just Stossel has a limited time. Right. And he wants to do the best representation. He wants to give a he yeah. wants to give a pretty good uh, representation. So he's taking a look at the front runners and when you take a look at the straw polls that have happened around the country, you've seen the debates and the debate winners. Um, those are the three that are consistently near the top. Yeah, so check that. Check those guys out for president. And I think you uh, go to isidewith.com and you can put in the issues that you care about and see what candidate you really stand with. Maybe you're listening and you're going to end up being a Trump person. Or maybe you're a Bernie person. Listen, we don't discriminate. If you're... Uh, uh, there's a big... <laughs> Mittens is now... Uh, we're recording and putting these on YouTube now, and Mittens is uh, loving the camera. She wants camera time. Yep. She's, a, she's, she's a real, looking for it. She's a real Lindsey Graham. Let me tell you. <laughs> Citizen of the green room. I, um, for me, if, I mean, if you're a Bernie sympathizer, like, you know, he, you and, I, and I've always said this, I think he's, you know, He's on the left, he's the most honest leftist there is True. in Congress, period, especially in the presidential candidates. Um, and so, you know, his message isn't entirely different. Um, he just really has a different way of going. He has the polar opposite way of going about it from where libertarians want to be. You know, the libertarian end point is about the equal application of justice and the law, and no one's ahead of anyone else. That's what Bernie runs on. You know, Bernie supporters think they've gotten a raw deal. Problem is the Gosh. thing that got the raw deal is the government. Well, they they should join the Ron Paul folks from two thousand eight and two thousand twelve on the raw deal. And a lot train. of a lot of the you know students for liberty crowd they're a little bit more civil libertarian oriented. You know the the people that came to the party from the civil libertarian side tend to be more sympathetic to Bernie, um, just for whatever reason because you know they have stuff left over where they still like to hear the anti corporate greed argument. And you know the problem is corporate greed comes from a government protection. Sure. Special status, not, you know, and you're not going to need more government your way out of that. Um, and so, you know, but if, if Bernie's the one that you have feelings for is seducing you, Gary Johnson is going to be my guess on the guy that is the libertarian candidate that is going to be the most appealing. There's not going to be anyone on the right unless you're a labor union type Democrat and then, you know, like an FDR Democrat, and then it's going to be Trump. Um, Ted Cruz used to be appealing on economics. Oh, God. He's not anymore. Um, there, I, I don't see anyone in the GOP. John Kasich. John Kasich's a neocon, and I don't know how you can justify that in this world after the experiences we've had over the last fifty years of failed foreign policy. Speaking of Kasich, I don't know if you guys saw the Cruz campaign trying to keep him off the ballot in Montana. Mm -hmm. I had nothing, nothing but Schadenfreude feelings about that. Right. Because <laughs> Kasich in two thousand fourteen was limiting in Ohio the Libertarian Party of Ohio's access to the ballot with their gubernatorial candidate, spending over half a million dollars to keep a former state rep, uh, Charlie Earle, who was the nominated candidate, from even being on the ballot, and it's caused uh, Ohio to lose party status in terms of their access. Yeah. Uh, so I, I felt absolutely nothing bad about seeing the tables turned on him, even in a state like Montana, which was not gonna have a big uh, delegate count for him, but it still feels kind of good to see those tricks used against him. So what I would say, um, I, I guess my response is, yeah, you can look at the Libertarian Party candidates, and they're, they're probably, even at the local level, there probably are not going to be a lot of Libertarian candidates, and we'll, we've been kind of talking about Libertarian Party stuff these last few episodes to give you a look inside. Um, but I think more than anything, if you need hope, you need to look inside yourself. Uh, it all starts with the individual, and so much of what I believe libertarianism to be is the golden rule and how you interact with others and how you 
uh, view the world and how you uh, how you see your community interacting with each other. So I don't I don't think that a politician is going to save us. I don't think if you're looking if you're looking for uh, less fear in the world, then you need to be the one that is leading the charge with your friends, family, and community. Because a politician's not going to do it. Because we live in an age of anxiety, and it is just easier to use shame and fear to get power than it is to use hope. Uh, you know, and hope and positivity feel phony in this day and age, especially coming from a politician. They don't have, it doesn't matter who the politician is unless it's a Bernie or a Ron Paul, somebody who has a long track record, they have established themselves as authority messengers. Uh, but, you know, Gary Johnson, when he was governor, he walked the walk and talks the talk. Somebody like Donald Trump or, t let's not pick on him, let's say t Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz doesn't seem like an authoritative messenger. He seems like a phony trying to get power. So he plays the positivity, hope, and change card, and he doesn't seem authentic. No, Ted's trying, I mean, you know, Ted's the penultimate politician and firebrand social conservative, and then he's got the intellectual credibility to back it up on the economics. What, why are you laughing? Because you used penultimate, penultimate wrong. wrong. I did? Well, yeah. <laughs> what is it? it means next to last. That'd be right, because he's actually not a social conservative at all. Well, there you right, go. but you talked about him as a, like, Oh, that's how he's branding himself. Yeah. Yeah, but he's not at all. Can you please right. hold your beer? My cat's ass is going to knock it over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry about that. Well, Got distracted. Well, last point fine. before I move us on. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but, you know, Ted, Ted doesn't oh. have any authenticity. Now, now Mittens wants to control the camera. I don't know if you noticed. She's... Yeah. Mittens, what are you doing? It's okay. She's a diva. Just one, just one thought uh, for your for your listener who wrote in. Uh, the other the other point is is uh, it's really the real shame is is not who our choices are. The real shame is that we really care this much about who president is because I mean we, we live in a uh, you know a federal system where if you if you look at it the president we shouldn't really even care who the president is right because the, the president's not supposed to have hardly any power at all. Foreign policy only. Yeah. Really, the power that the vice president has is about as much power as the president should have. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean we should be, we should be more worried about who's in Congress. We should be more worried yeah. about who our governor is, uh, who, who our who, city councilman who, is, who our city councilman is. Um, honestly, I mean, you know, I, as much as I hate Trump, if he becomes president, I, is there really going to be? If we hold, you know, uh, the government accountable to what their limits are, you know, via you know federalism, do do we really care who's president? Crystal, you don't seem like the type that will just bully your way in uh, to this conversation. Is there anything that you'd like to say on this topic? I don't think that there's any hope within the two-party system. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there are any candidates out there who are especially great. Um, and it's that your writer did mention that she was uh, looking for some hope. Um, as far as libertarian candidates are concerned, I agree. That's a great place to look. Really, any third party is a great place to look. Um, and I think that you'll find, as you speak with others about it, that people tend to be generally negative about the chances that those people have of winning, which can tend to, I don't know, be a little discouraging. Um, but it's important to make sure that you're communicating that you are, um, I guess, more concerned with the substance, more concerned with the principle. And, of course, if more people voted that way, if they voted their conscience as opposed to but for who they assumed was going to win, then maybe those people could win. Maybe those third-party candidates would stand a chance. Yeah, I, w I wish people treated the voting booth as a way to speak their mind and show what they really think rather than treating it as if they're at the track and they're trying to pick the yeah, right. It's, it's, <laughs> right. It'd be personal choice rather than rational expectation. <laughs> how, many, how many election yeah. cycles have we heard? I really agree with that guy, but I'm too afraid of Hillary getting in, so I'm not going to vote for my conscience. Right? It's all I have ever heard, right. really. Well, yeah. We've worked outreach since. Four, so four years ago, campaigns. she was the Georgia uh, state director <coughs> for uh, Gary Johnson's campaign. Right, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that's the majority of the, the emails that I handled were, you know, outside of just general policy questions. So if you're one of those people, please, grow some balls. Right. Grow some balls. Or ovaries. Fair enough. Nothing is tougher than, uh, as I heard a comedian say, listen. That was Betty White. I, I know where you're going. She, listen, I don't know why we uh, why we say uh, quit quit being a, a pussy. No, it's, why don't you grow a pair? 
No, right? th- this comedian was saying, I don't know why we call people a pussy because a pussy is the, the toughest thing in the world. It takes a pounding and that thing. You ever seen a baby come out of that? And it goes right back to where it was. So I don't remember who that comedian was. It was very funny. Uh, well, especially it when they did. Like the thing that Betty White said. It's paraphrase on yeah, her. Which is what she said. Of, yeah. But hers no. is about, you know, why why talk about balls when you talk about a vagina, they take a pounding. Ah, okay. So this comedian's hack then. Uh, all right. Was it, was it Amy Schumer? Oh. Uh, so, Not nice. so part of what we want to talk about um, is inclusiveness. And uh, we've had a situation here in Indiana. Um. So much of what new people, so this person uh, that we just read this article, uh, this note from, Vanessa, is a disaffected Republican looking for a new home. There are plenty of disaffected Democrats, disaffected uh, just voters, independents that eventually gravitate towards the Libertarian Party. And part of the problem that I have found is that people come to the Libertarian Party and their candidates with an expectation of perfection. And uh, they take all the negative attributes of where they, uh, of, to use the Queen's English, from whence they came, uh, and put all of the opposite onto the Libertarian Party and their candidates. So, listen, I hate the Republicans because of all the drama and the infighting. And then they get to the Libertarian Party and they just expect everything to be roses and everybody gets along and everything's Rainbows fine and, and there, puppy dogs, yeah. there isn't any politics whatsoever and a lot of times there isn't a lot of politics it, it is more club oriented sometimes because there aren't competitive races like there should be uh, because not enough people like you step up and run for office listener uh and so when there is uh, a differing of opinions especially on something like facebook you get all these outsiders going, Oh my god! Oh, this infighting is terrible! That's why I left the Republican Party! You're all exactly like the other party! I'm not going to be involved in the Libertarian Party! And I, I just... It really chaps my ass to hear that sort of thing, because it is not the Libertarian Party's job to be perfect. It is your job to get over your expectations of perfection... And to realize that any group of people will have differing opinions and different strategies on how to do things. And yes, there should be civility and ways to have conversations. But at the end of the day, you all come together and, and you just say, listen, I, you know, th- so there's a race. <laughs> and boy, is there a race happening here in Indiana. We've talked a little bit about it on the podcast. Uh, and, and the reason that we talk about this, yes, we are a national show. We want to appeal to all of our listeners. Um, but we want to use Indiana as sort of a lab, a microcosm of the libertarian at large. And so we're here, and this is what we know, and this is what we can explain. So, and it's a little similar to the National LP race. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. So, There's a lot yeah. of the parallels. It's so, a lot of the Austin Gary uh, yes. in, in fighting on a small, or, you know, granular level. Uh, so you know, a lot of what happens is what what is happening, and we're not going to get into the candidates. You can go listen to the raw audio pod. Podcast uh, Raw Audio Politics podcast feed and listen to the debate and make your own decision. And we've talked about, we've had Rex Bell on, we've talked about Jim Wallace, um, and those little two guys, Jimmy. little Jimmy with his small hands, uh, about the, the race for governor. And there is one particular supporter of Jim Wallace, another person we've had on the podcast, uh, our friend Melissa. Regrettably so. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I maintain a friendship with Melissa, although I cannot say the same between Greg and Melissa at this point. Oh, um, boy. But it, it, it just really took a turn this week. There's something really that the flip, the switches flipped this week, and it, and it kind of went into overdrive. Uh, and, you know, we were all getting along, and I don't know why we can't just get along, Greg. I had her blocked, so I was unaware it's all going on. It's you guys <laughs> were the one saw it all going on. <laughs> so basically what happened is... You know, the people in the party who don't believe that a person with a, a, a two arrests, with two different wives for direct domestic violence is a person that should be at the top of our ticket. Uh, the, and if you go and you Google Jim Wallace, Indiana, you, you'll see that all the top results, it isn't until the second page of results that you get to his 2016 campaign page because it's so buried by the articles and it's not a matter of what happened or lit- litigating, because let me be very clear and very 
very let me just be very clear. What happened with Jim Wallace is not what happened with Amanda. And we did not put that episode out because of this race, because there is there's very, very few parallels between those. It was just Amanda was ready to tell her story, and I, the timing may look suspect, but that's not what happened. And I have informed the other the, the other camp that that's the case. There, what happened in the Wallace case is not what hap- has happened to Karen. Uh, what has happened to Amanda. Um, so, I just want to make that really clear. So... But the problem is, if you're running for governor and you've got that kind of Google problem, it's very hard to explain that away. Because it doesn't matter what the truth or the reality of the situation is. It's like a one... Low energy. You're a one-issue candidate. Lion Ted. Right. Little Marco. It, it yep. just, it's well, the perception is what it's, matters in politics. It's, it's the same problem Ron Paul had on the national yeah. stage is that mm-hmm. his ideas were so complex, it took him too long to explain right. it. If you have to take too long to explain your history... You're gone. Yeah. Well, and even with Ron Paul with the newsletters and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Oh, that yeah. That I forgot about that. Yeah. From Absolutely. the principles and the beliefs yep. that he held and the, the issues that he... Uh, that he trumpeted mm-hmm. were overshadowed when those started to get traction. It was it was always something that was in the back pocket. That hey oh oh remember these right. have remember you won these? the nomination. That's what the Democrats would have run the entire time. And yep. if and if you go back and you listen to the debates that Jim and Rex have had, Jim in this last debate basically says, "Listen, things happen when you get divorced. You do crazy things when you're in love." Uh, you, 75% of people have been divorced and to attack them is a foolish strategy for anyone that wants to come against me. And I would just say that like, I've been divorced and my wife threw out accusations that I was abusive and because of the nature of my character and the, the strength of my friendships and the person that I am, my friends laughed in her face. Like it, it just, it's, you know, it, there's, there was no smoke, so there was no fire. So I understand that yes, accusations happen and things are when you have a marriage breakdown, things are very difficult. But it it is it's very hard to get arrested for for these two crimes that he's been arrested for, and it's just a very serious thing in the eyes of the voter. And it he has done a very poor job over the last three months, walking through this. You know, I sat down with him with with. Uh, I sat down with him in January and basically said... It's okay, Chris. You can tell him I was there Okay, too. all right. I just didn't want to out you if you didn't want me to. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, Brett and I sat down and we just basically said in January, it is now April 1st almost, um, you need to own it and you need to come out and you need to be very clear about it and you need to just say, this is what happened. I regret it. I'm sorry it happened. And you need to start fixing the Google problem. And instead, what has happened is we've been thrown into chats and told to shut up by their team repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Well, not only did we have the advice to offer, we both made ourselves available for follow-up. Absolutely. At that meeting, because it it ended abruptly because it was before an event. And so both Chris and I made ourselves available, provided contact information, and said, hey, we'd love to help strategize with you to help you have a message that's going to be palatable to voters, to delegates first, to voters second, uh, because the people that are going to be supporting the Libertarian Party candidate, regardless of who they are, are going to want to know how they're going to have to address some of the issues. There are some issues with with Rex that that people have thrown out. You know, his level of education is something that people have thrown out there, which that's not something that affects me personally. But it's certainly a lot easier when you talk about his business experience and those things than it is to n- flounder about why the guy you're supporting is perceived to be an an abuser. And adherent to the non-aggression principle. Right. And that's a big thing for libertarians is the non-aggression And he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, the charges weren't dismissed. In both cases, he was given a diversion. And, uh, and, you know, there's different theories on why he was given a diversion. But again, my point has been consistent. None of that matters. All that matters is messaging. And, This is a key point in politics or any kind of PR disaster in which you face. Um, You get out ahead of it first. If you are explaining, you are losing. And if you aren't explaining and you're covering up, it is the cover-up that always starts to implode. 
Uh, that is what makes things worse. Bill Clinton's the prime example of that. If he had just come out and said, yep, I had sex, sexual relations with that woman, yep. he wouldn't have gone to the, he wouldn't have been impeached. Hillary and I are dealing with it, and it's a you know, personal matter. And he, if he had just come out and faced it head on, and this is, this is so central to everything we talk about on this podcast, openness, honesty, vulnerability, being capable of managing your emotions, uh, and just letting people see you for you, being yourself, being unguarded, and that is what attracts people to you. And if you are a libertarian that lives that kind of lifestyle, if you're the libertarian that lives the golden rule, you don't have to be a Christian to, to live the golden rule. Everybody wants to be treated as they would like to be treated. Uh, and, and then you extend that to your politics where, listen, I don't want people stealing from me, so I'm not, I don't want to be taxed. Taxation is theft. Where's Chloe when you need her? Oh, hey, that was a nice way to uh, work that in. But, it, you know, our, and if you go look at the path to libertarianism on wearelibertarians.com, it walks you through, listen, your political beliefs need to be the extension of your moral values. And so when you have someone who has these kind of charges, we have to be clear uh, that you are an authentic person, you are a vulnerable person, that you are a trustworthy person, because the voter cares most about trust and authenticity. They don't care that you went to Harvard. They don't care that you went to West Point. They don't care that you work for Bain Capital. They don't care that you're rich. They don't care about any of that. They care, can I trust you? Are you an honest person? And so repeatedly, uh, this campaign has done things that have undermined that and have tried to hide these th the fact and, and obfuscate. Uh, and listen if you didn't want to answer questions about it you shouldn't have run for governor uh so you know well, yeah, and, it, and it has led to you know the the county convention the the candidate jim wallace's county convention was last night and there were five delegates to the convention because the goal is to win delegates you show up and 120 people select their candidate because we don't have a primary in the libertarian party we have delegates Rex is a longtime libertarian, so Rex has been trying to secure, secure delegates, and he's been talking one-on-one, -on -one, interpersonally, to delegates. He's been doing strategic delegate outreach. The other guy, Jim Wallace, the guy who's been a Republican since no, uh, he became a libertarian in November, has been running a primary campaign by doing a bunch of different outreach events, stepping on toes. And you know what that led? That led to him being an alternate on the delegate list. To he didn't become convention. a delegate to his own county convention? He, no, his, he was not. I haven't his, heard that. In his own county convention, he was selected as an alternate and not a delegate. He was actually beat by Rex's daughter. Does that ever happen? Never. I'm no. new. I'm new. No, so I'm no, usually, <laughs> yeah, I mean, granted, I, I come from a larger uh, 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 county than Hamilton County, but usually, I mean, if you're a delegate and you're showing up, and especially for a statewide race, or I'm sorry, if you're a candidate and you're showing up for a statewide race, I mean, that's pretty typical. It's like, oh, okay, well, we're going to let this guy vote for himself. So what or, it, or woman. Sorry. So the discussion, and this is where wow. I, will, well, I will open it up to the floor, because Greg, Greg, Brett, and I have taken a lot of heat, especially Greg because of his memes, and Brett because of his uh, bringing down the, the legal side of the issue, and me saying this is a messaging issue. Uh, that's Having the foresight to get out ahead of it, because in case it's the candidate, you know how to tackle it head on. Well, and not only that, I, I have a story to tell when we get to, to me with regard to a candidate that both Crystal and I worked with, um, who had an October surprise that none of us knew about, and it was simply a police report that involved a call about possible domestic violence. And he right. ended up losing his race. Yeah, and, and I don't want to make it about the candidates. I want to make it a larger discussion. because And so here is, here is the discussion point that I'd like to make. Um, from my point of view, and I think from your point of view, fellas, uh, the, and lady. that campaign mm -hmm, and that candidate have done a lot of things that have stepped on a lot of toes and have not handled things the right way because they're all new to the party, which this is very common People switch parties and immediately want to like, I'm going to be the front runner. It's like, you don't get into a new job. If you're the new guy at work, you got to kind of hang out and figure things out. And that, that's going to make you more successful in the long run than just being the guy. Well, you have to learn the culture first. Yeah, it's a totally different culture. And that's why we've done these podcasts to try and explain libertarian party culture to people who are, are 
Ryan, Rand Paul Republicans looking for a new home, and they don't quite understand what the Libertarian Party is. People like Greg, who is a brand new Libertarian Party member, uh, you know, which is funny because you're trying to keep new members out. But so here's my <laughs> point: we have a definite point of view that people made choices and people had certain made did certain things of which were just outlined, and that alienated people, and that left a campaign and a candidate open to criticism and yes we all support the other guy but this has made all of our resolve for that candidate stronger uh, and it is not because Jim Wallace is not a libertarian I think Jim Wallace is a libertarian True. and I think without this issue Jim would be the a candidate home run. he'd be a home run he would be an absolute credit to the libertarian party without even this if, issue even early on if he hadn't you know when you guys had that meeting and I'll say it, because I wasn't a member of the party yet, so I was just observing. And, you know, I, li I like this message. I think he has a compelling and updated message. And simply by having data and not buying the, the messaging, or, you know, even saying, listen, I get it. This is how you handle it, but this, these are re this is the reality, and we're not against you, but we have to know how to, the best way to do this. By not just being on board immediately, an immediate demonization campaign started. Mm -hmm. Immediate. Less than 24 hours. Me, is it meaning what? Oh, against you two. Yeah. Discrediting you two, establishment, you're the ones demanding purity, you're the old guard that doesn't want to see your influence lost within the party you built, yada, 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 yada. Right. And, you know, I got grouped in because of this, but I, that was hell. Like, two, I've only been to two or three really, like, libertarian party things. Ever. <laughs> ever. And it was like, and then he goes on public radio and calls me part of the establishment. I'm like, wow, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> you weren't even a member. Yeah, I'm not right. even a member of the GOP establishment. <laughs> <laughs> And so the, it's like, I wish that he had taken my advice because I think he would be a good candidate, but he didn't. And instead what has happened is there's been demonization of the other side as party establishment, like you said, that we're not welcoming and inclusive to new people, that we're trying to drive new members away just because we simply don't accept the fact that a person with two arrests that can't message it isn't acceptable at the top of our ticket. And that somehow has made us... Uh, and actually, that's okay. I, I don't know what like, the word is. That doesn't bother me like so much either. It's, you know... Targets. Targets yeah, is a good Divisive. Yeah, yeah. Divisive. Divisive. Polarizing people. Polarizing but... and divisive. And so this is my... And so now the charge has been from Melissa, specifically, is that the three of us, and Sam Goldstein, a former chair, who was on this program recently... Are, are just being divisive and, uh, and by speaking our mind and challenging the other campaign, we have become infighters and we're tearing apart the party that we helped build and that we're embarrassing the party that uh, we are... Uh, childish, don't forget childish. Childish and unwelcoming to new members and that new members don't want to join. And there is some truth to that. Very reputable people that I respect have said, listen, I've had to have a lot of conversations with some new people who are interested in the party because of Jim or because of other factors, and they see the arguments on Facebook, and they have to pause. And I just have to say to those people that this is specific conversations that happen should not be internalized by you. Just because you see a conversation about a candidate that you support, let's say you see a conversation, you're an Austin supporter, and you see somebody say something nice about Gary and mean against Austin, that doesn't mean that they're talking about you, you self-centered bastard. Like it, you, People internalize way too much and, and take on this emotion about politics that is ridiculous. And you have to be grown up enough to understand that you can have rational political discussions where people oppose other people without all the emotion surrounding it. And, and like, cro it's called the race for the presidential primary of the two major parties in the public press. Right. You can have someone tear someone down for eight months and turn around and give an acceptance or a speech, you know, when someone pulls out and praise the person and ask them to be on staff. But, and, it, and it is so you much. Don't have to be butthurt. Right. It is so much more intense in the Libertarian Party because it is so much smaller and everybody knows each other so well that it's almost like ruining friendships. And it just. I've seen it for the last eight years, and it's just absolutely ridiculous to me uh, that people who have been friends for 12 years can't handle the fact that I just don't agree with you. We just don't agree. 
Like, and I will say this, like, there, there are people on his campaign... That... And it's not that far, though, because what's happened is not that, or I'd have never gotten involved, because right, okay. I had my... I, I mean, but you too. We both had our concerns, but we never aired them publicly. Right. We kept them to private conversations and talked to people about it and said, let's have the facts. But we didn't ever make a public post about it. Ever. And then we were attacked. And if you were going to call me out, or you're going to call me... You're going to... You, you know, people can't separate We Are Libertarians and the Libertarian Party of Indiana. Two separate entities. To, uh, Entirely separate entities. They can't separate you and I. No, and they, you know, people think what we do is childish, and it's childish by design because it's the model we found to grow. Well, and when and your membership is 240 and some change, and we have 4,000 weekly subscribers, maybe you should be a little more childish. And I'm not going to just accept that argument because I don't think anyone is watching. I had I was attacked by that this week. I was attacked by two people I actually know personally. That were considering coming over, one of them thinks Barack Obama's an imam, and the other one is still a member of the Democratic Party and has no intent but flirts because they have no influence in the Democratic Party and they want to come to somewhere they perceive as a small pool where they'll have pool. Yeah. They're both losers. Any party loses that has them a part of it, and that should never be tossed around as potential quote unquote recruits. All right. So you're arguing that it's addition by subtraction. If we are going to win by courting the Facebook comment vote, <laughs> <laughs> this is a failed policy anyway. I mean, right. it's, it's never going to work. If you're going to win voters by trying to appear professional and appealing and courting Facebook commenters, and not even commenters, voyeurs, Facebook voyeur commenters, I mean... Is it, that doesn't strike anybody else as absurd. Yeah. Absolutely. And the thing is, is when you when you look at the childish stuff, it's the mockery that today's politics deserves. Yeah. But that's yeah. that's our tagline: is all of the all exactly. of the irreverence that modern politics deserves. Right. Is the tagline right. of libertarian. And, but we the are libertarians. but the mockery that that is happening in the way that the memes come out. And you know? I mock on the wall page. I right. mock the major parties. Sure. I never have taken a shot at a libertarian. Ever. Only yeah. support. I made Gary Johnson Miss, uh, Captain America. Right. You know, so, you, I mean, you did well, put you a did bit of Trump hat. And, and, no, that wasn't the public one. I know. Well, just, and you used the wrong logo. Well, that's in a personal attack at Brett Bittner, which is fine. <laughs> which is, but you know we're, what? That Greg is and I have that. worked it out. Yeah. We're fine with it. Yes. Well, I mean, people forget what politics is. Right. I mean, you're, you're, there's supposed to be passionate oppositional uh, you know, discourse. You know, there is the loyal opposition. We're supposed to disagree because, I mean... Outside of, you know, before we invented politics, people went to wars to figure out and killed each other to figure out who was going to be the next person in charge. And, and yeah, so we're going to have disagreements and we should have disagreements about, um, you know, and actually I kind of, I've been to a lot of conventions and I've been to a lot of conventions where there was no uh, contest, you know, there was no contested race for governor. It's boring. You know, yeah, it's really boring. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, yeah, I, I'm a Rex supporter. But yeah, you know, Rex, you know, should be questioned about a few things and add, and asked to speak because it makes us all stronger by uh, by addressing our weaknesses and, and 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 realizing our strengths. A great example of that happened four years ago when Gary Johnson, after he switched from the Republican primary to seek the Libertarian nomination, he was challenged internally in the party by Lee Wrights, who's a longtime activist and yep. probably a little more radical than Gary's pragmatism. And what it ended up doing was as they were debating throughout the country, because Gary had opposition, it made Gary a better candidate. Yep. It made him a, a stronger libertarian because he had to answer a lot of the questions that Lee raised. And it was, it was kind of a foregone conclusion that Gary was going to get the nomination. I mean, he's a former two-term governor. Uh, he has the, pol the political, the business, the executive experience. But having to answer the questions that were raised by Lee Wrights and Wrights supporters really did make Gary a better candidate. And I, I love the heck out of Lee, but he had no chance right. of winning, but he did the party a great service, I believe, by standing up and, and making Gary that better candidate. And that is what's happening now. I was thinking about this the other day because there have been two debates, one by Abdul Hakim Shabazz and Rob, and the other by Rob Kendall, two friends of the program. Uh, and, you know, Jim Wallace ran in the Republican primary against Mike Pence four years ago. But Rand's a bit strong. 
But he was never in a debate. He's never filed, been in a debate. Filed against him. Rex has been in debates, but not a, a gubernatorial debate. And so these two radio debates were the first time that any gubernatorial candidate has sat and thought about, gee, how am I going to handle a debate? How am I going to answer all these issue questions? How am I going to do an open statement, opening statement and a closing statement? And yeah, how was that building that four years ago for Rupert, Chris? It was tough. It, it was uh, this time four years ago. We were already doing mock debates, and we didn't have that kind of experience. And it would have been really good for Rupert, and it is really good for Jim and Rex. Whoever goes on to win, they have that experience that now the other two parties don't. They, the, their John Gregg and Mike Pence are not challenged. They're, They're sailing through to November. Right, and so our guys have to fight it out. And so that benefits. That That's good for the party. And so, you know, I, I just want to say undeniably, from my point of view, I don't I don't speak for anybody else on the show or anybody else that, you know, there's a lot of group think going on where somehow Brett and Greg and Sam and... Everybody, we all have, it's any, the hive mind. Anybody we're else who supports together. Rex Bell all thinks the same thing, but... I think I think that Jim Wallace's place in the race has been good. I think that he would be a good candidate without his issues, and he probably could have done better had he actually tried to take his issue seriously as opposed to trying to hide it. And the reality of the situation is the United States Senate is way more accepting of background issues. That's the race you should be running in. Look at Ted Kennedy. Right, right. Well, I mean, yeah, I just lost my point. Sorry. 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 I apologize. That's okay. No, it bugs me because you guys get blamed for stuff I do. I do what I do because I try to grow our brand. Yeah. I don't go. To, I don't try to assume positions on leadership councils with the LP. I specifically told everyone, I was like, I'm not sure you really want me here. I haven't been in a leadership position within it, the Libertarian Party of Indiana for three years. Yeah, and like that's, I haven't gone to a meeting in three years until this year. And like you know, the reason you're involved is because one person decided to pursue it. Right. <laughs> that should be a pretty decent litmus test on who should be the candidate. Right. Yeah. I, I I felt that. I, I just saw him get into the race, and I just was kind of surprised by it because I couldn't believe that anybody who with that kind of a Google problem would run, and so I didn't quite understand it, so I started calling around to, to my old friends, and I said, why are you doing this? Well, it was just a, he says it was just a he said, she said. Really? Because it was two different women and ten years apart. It wasn't a he said, she said. I mean, I was I was around. It was that. a he, she, 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 she said. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, the whole truth wasn't told. And that is what led to Rex getting in the race. That is what led to a lack of support. That is what led to Jim being an alternate to his own convention. And, you know, I'm not to blame for those choices. Neither is Brett, neither is Greg, neither is Rex, neither is anybody else. And so in a party of personal responsibility, I'm tired of being bullied by people who think that they have a very loud voice for for not getting in line. And like, bull- that's not bullied, how it works. Bullied is a good word because, I mean, I uh, what, the point I was going to make earlier was, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing here is that, like an invasion of what's going on in the national you know, politics and everything that's going, everything that's wrong with American politics is uh, kind of seeping into uh, this race right now. And it's this idea that, like, there, no, we're not going to have rational discourse. We're not going to have, you know, a, an open debate. What we're going to have is we're going to have our little two camps, and if you're, and it's in, in the wor- words of George W. Bush, if you're not with us, you know, then you're, you're, you're with the other group. And, and you we're against you. And you don't want libertarianism and, to spread in, in Diana. Yeah, and, and, and instead of, like, making a case and, 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 like, doing the work, going after the delegate counts and stuff like that, um, instead of doing that, one, the, the minute somebody you know brings up, and I've been watching this from the outside for the most part, but it seems like every time someone like tries to bring up, hey, what about this concern? They're immediately shot down and attacked. And, uh, for here's being, a MySpace for, a, a, a poll call, which shows that isn't real. Well, it, but it, I mean, but, that's but, what's yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, no, not, you're you you are like the the V guy. I mean, Tim's like one of the nicest guys in the entire Libertarian Party. You always volunteer. You do all the extra work. You rarely ever ask for thank you, and you live. You don't pick sides. You support right. whoever did. you go along to get along. You know, I guess you are. You, you totally really are established. Yeah, you, really are. <laughs> you just made the case. Yeah, yeah, nice I'm so sorry, Tim. <laughs> you no, but I mean, like, I mean you, you're, I not, you're a consensus builder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you know, we 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 got to find the best person with the job, and and but 
I'm sorry, just bringing up concerns is not attacking somebody. And, and talking about how I would rather have one guy over the other is not attacking somebody. And, and to throw a fit like a two-year-old because you're not go, going behind what somebody else thinks is the best choice, I mean, I mean it's childish. Publicly. So, so what, what do we expect from membership? And, and listen, we are a small party as libertarians. We have to grow the party. We have a lot of voters. But like the actual paying members right. aren't, you know, doesn't reflect the size right. of the voting base. The the membership of the party, the people who come and show up, they're the they're the base of marketing materials, marketing dollars, candidates, um, and and functional party building. I mean, party building is important, and so and it's important at all levels. Mm -hmm. You know, from the county affiliate level all the way up to national. So, you raised the question or the 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 point, Greg, that some people just shouldn't be welcome. Yeah. Well, and, and explain that. Well, I mean, here's the idea. So, Gary Johnson becomes a libertarian. He immediately, he's an alpha libertarian. One Gary Johnson equals 100,000 new libertarians and probably 300,000 people looking at it. One, um, Ian Freeman might bring you 50 libertarians, or anarchists, black and yellow, but immediately costs you 50,000 people that might otherwise consider it. And it's, it's, purely, it's purely an example of what you consider to be the main... You know, the Libertarian Party... Why, I said why this, him specifically? Or not Ian Freeman, but the people that like him. The people that call in about chemtrails. The people that call in about building 7 and 9-11 being an inside you job. You mean more like an Alex Jones. Because right. Because it's unfair to paint Ian as a conspiracy theorist. I mean, I'm not his more, supporters. Right. Ian brings that camp with him. Right. But he, Ian like, isn't one. Let's say like an Alex Jones black and yellow crowd. Sure. Right. Yeah. Alex Jones you would would be a guy you wouldn't want to court. Why? Because the people that listen to his show live in rural Texas or live in New Mexico and call in through, you know, tour operating systems and satellite or uh, you know, uh, tinfoil apparatuses that can connect to satellite internet. You know, they're they're people that are fringe and they're fine, they're harmless, but every one of those you have costs you, I'd say, 50 to 1, maybe 100 to 1 of the, like getting a guy like Gary Johnson or Ron Paul. And so there's nothing wrong with... Former Republicans, is that what you're saying? Greg? No, getting, um, uh, who's another, I mean, there just aren't a lot of people that come in from the left. Kathy Reisenwitz brings you people. Um, Mike Gravel. Mike Gravel. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and like a, but a lot of people. It's Brian starting Schweitzer with, is Brian kind Schweitzer. of libertarian-leaning awesome. Democrat. I, he's former governor of Montana. Yep. Just an awesome guy. Um, he's actually the one I wrote like a year ago. Like this guy runs for the Democrats. He's mm -hmm. going to be the Reagan Democrat. Yeah. Well, and and you have like Trey and Matt from yeah, South Park. Perfect. They they come from the left. cultural left. Right. Yeah. Like that. That's a great way to. Play. Yeah. Yeah. So like, and those guys have such credibility. And all of a sudden, just by them being alpha consumer types, which are now self-identifying identifying libertarians, you just got every South Park person are now aware, oh, these guys are libertarians. Mm -hmm. Well, why, what is a, you know, they start doing their own investigations. For every Melissa you have, for every um, Alex Jones you have in the party, some of the fringe presidential candidates, the, it's addition by subtraction. Yeah. I was you are on, way more appealing, and people don't feel the need to explain their decision. They can tell people proudly. What one of the, the the recent donors, Michael, that I was talked about earlier, said, "Listen, I heard you on uh, I heard you through the Bob and Tom show, which is a major comedy national white comedy show. It was on a podcast called Off the Air with Chick McGee. I recommend it. Check it out. And he heard me through there, and he said, you know, I wasn't sure about this libertarian stuff, but I heard you on there. You convinced me." And now he's donating to us. He's listening to us. He's promoting our stuff. I mean, there, and it's because I went on there and I talked about things that were, I didn't talk about big abstract. I mean, it, I think it's in the feed if you go back and check it out, uh, that appearance. But basically, I talked about, listen, my values are this. Here's what I want from society, which is everyone to prosper. I want people to live harmoniously. I want us to have less Amanda situations, and I think that the best way to do that is through libertarianism. Look, you're up. selling, uh, you're selling benefits, not you know, uh, features. Absolutely. I what we have to do when we are selling libertarianism 
is we have to, when you're selling anything, the fundamental proposition in advertising and marketing today in this world of self-centered millennials is, okay, you're talking in my ear right now, what are you offering? You know, what we are libertarians offer you, well, let me break this down, there's problems in society, there's problems in the libertarian community, there's problems in libertarian media, there's a lot of people that are just boring. There are great, great people in the libertarian media establishment, but they're they're what? They're, the podcast establishment, right? Oh, okay, right. All right. The, they're fringy or conspiracy theorists, or they're professors, or they're talking about facts and studies and figures. So it's boring. If you're a libertarian, where's the entertainment? You know, and coming from my background of entertainment radio, I saw an opportunity. I'm going to get my friends and a bunch of us together, and we're going to put together that something entertaining that people want to listen to. It's entertaining and intelligent at the same time. And it's entertaining to participate in as somebody who wasn't here at the beginning. Right. It's something you guys have been very welcoming to me when I've said, hey, let's do this, or yep. I pushed my way into Chris's apartment to be on the podcast because why not? And I've we benefited hugely from making a murderer. We're, exactly. And that was your idea. You making know, we, that's huge. A making <laughs> of a murderer, you guys. Come on. I, and so, yeah, I think it, and so another problem is that people, these, the media that exists for libertarians is collegiate level. We don't want to be collegiate level. We're, yeah, you don't want to be Stossel. You don't want to be Judge Napolitano. You're looking for something that's a little more casual. Right. I'm talking Cato. They walk you down the, the rabbit hole. We want to get them you know, at the rim and help you know, get right. them to jump in. We, we, right. you know, we want to be your guide to libertarianism. We don't want to sit here and be the heroes of your story. We want to tell you, listen, <laughs> you are... You are the one out there in the trenches. You are the one selling libertarianism. Here's the resources that you need. Here's the talking points that you need. Here's how you do it. And we're helping you navigate this stuff. Because what I have found, the problem that libertarians have is they think they don't know enough about activism and politics to make a difference. Mm. And they don't think they know enough about ideology. And so what we have done here is try to give you solutions to those problems. So... Uh, we as libertarians have to start looking at voters. If you're in the Libertarian Party or a libertarian, you have to start looking at problems and solutions. And you have to make it personal for your audience. You have to make your audience understand that being a libertarian will benefit you. You are the person that can be the hero of your story if the government gets off your back. How, how prosperous would Amanda be if, how, how much healthier would her family be? How much stronger would she and her daughter be if the government hadn't quote unquote helped? <laughs> you know? Hadn't been her advocate. Right. Had the government not uh, thrown Woody's daughter into a prison for 16 years over a victimless crime and selling three prescription pills, she'd be alive today. The government didn't help. The government created a problem when the point of government should be solving problems, which is if someone murders me, who's going to put them in a jail? You know, and so libertarians, politics exists. People are going to fight. There's going to be infighting. You just got to try and have rational discussions, and you got to try and, and do it in a way that is not... Awful. You know, I, I really don't like this word infighting because, I mean, okay. it, I mean yeah, it, it, and this, this has been bothering me since we started this podcast, or I'm sorry, since we started tonight. Um, infighting kind of tells me like, oh, well, Chris, that, you know, two years ago, you took a piece of my pizza and you didn't say thank you. So now I'm going to fight against everything that you've ever done before. It's funny because last night at the Hamilton yeah. County Convention where yeah. you and I both were, Joe was searching for my analogy yeah. for for what a lot of the, the actual infighting within yeah. the military Yeah, I mean, is. that's what infighting is. Right. It's personality you conflict. You didn't vote for my bylaws you know, amendment in 1987, yeah. Tim. Oh, we can yeah. never be on the same side of an a issue ever again. A absolutely. And, and, like, and when Mark Rutherford uh, ran for chair, uh, was it four years ago, uh, he faced the same kind of stuff that, you know, people, you know, you know, created documents of like, oh, well, you know, 
80 times 80 percent of the time mark voted with wayne allen root well i don't like wayne allen root so therefore i don't like you know mark rutherford right group for, think. yeah right. forget the fact that like you mean know girls may, politics may, may, yeah. like maybe mark was influencing mark you know wayne allen root and wayne was actually voting no that, that that was never part of the discussion so that's i think what infighting is i think what's going on with rex versus jim and everything here in indiana it's it, i i call it due diligence you know, if somebody yeah. wants to be at the top of our ticket, we have to have a process for vetting them, and this is that process. And, and sometimes well, people just get real uncomfortable with other be, being held accountable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and again, it goes back to the whole childish. Yeah, I, I, the word that keeps coming to my mind is Trump. You know, you 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 say anything against, uh, and I'm not I'm not saying you know J Jim specifically, but there's a lot of people out there like this. You say one word against them, and they throw a hissy fit, and they 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 the self victimization. Yeah. No, to be clear, I mean Jim has been gracious in the face of my concerns. I mean he has taken the time, and and I want to be clear, Jim has offered to sit down and talk until he just realized it was kind of a lost cause. Like I had made up my mind. Like he has at least publicly and in every discussion I've ever had with him been uh, as willing to converse in a very respectful way as possible. And, and that's a good point. At, at the Hamilton County meeting, he actually did take time to take questions and he actually answered them. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, it's not a beat up on Wallace thing. I, it certainly isn't. It's this is more about the discussion going on between supporters of the two candidates and outsiders looking at that discussion and having a reaction to it. Have you who who is it? Who knows? No one's told you this person has a problem because of your Facebook debate. I have personally offered to sit down with anyone that has a problem. If I'm the boogeyman, I will go and meet with them and take the boogeyman status away. Nobody, you know, I helped build the leadership. Oh, no, no, I mean, like, someone has come to you specifically and said, hey, what, your antics are pushing people away. Who, who, and I just would, you know, want to know if some, they've given you an actual name of someone that read through a Facebook comment section and decided not to become a libertarian. They have not. Yeah. Anyone ever done that to you? Nope. Crystal? Uh, no. Tim? No. Huh. The reality is, in the way high school, I feel like... You know, you grow up and you feel like everyone's watching and everything's a big deal. You know, like every decision in your life, everything the you shoes do. you wear. Yeah. Think of all these the people are thinking you're about You're the me. star of your own show. Everyone's thinking yeah. about me. What is? What are these people going to think? Then you get to college and you realize, holy shit, these people weren't thinking about me at all. <laughs> I'm in a big a C. I don't have yeah. a show. Yeah. What the hell? Right. I people. don't identify with that at all. <laughs> <laughs> a, a good friend of mine, her mantra is, no one's thinking about me, everyone's thinking about themselves, yep. just like you are. My godmother, perfect. The whole yeah. time I was growing up, she tried to, you know, it doesn't matter the clothes that you wear, it doesn't matter the, the clubs that you're involved in, it doesn't matter because everybody's so self-absorbed in their own world. Like Crystal said, everybody has is the star of their own show, and no one is really paying attention to anybody else. That's why I just said you have to market to people's problems. You have to solve their problems. Well, you, but, we, we sit there as libertarians and go, society has these problems. We need, And that's why nobody cares about what we say. Because we're not saying what Republicans say, which is, I'm going to keep your family safe. I'm well, going to, you know, Democrats yeah, say, I'm going to help you. Yeah. Benefits to your life, making it more convenient. And so yesterday, the person that actually, that's what gets me mad, is they attack Chris for my stuff. Right. And, you know, my stuff, I don't... No, what I get is, can you go talk to X, X, X right. and get them to stop? And I go, I'm not in charge of them. You go talk to them. <laughs> I don't give a shit what they right. do. Right, and so right. this person, so I go, oh, you know, I, I uh, who, who is afraid? So they gave me names. They tagged them. I researched the two people. One thinks Barack Obama's an imam, and the other one is a lifelong Democrat, isn't losing, is just butthurt because... He doesn't have any influence in the Democrat Party, and he sure as hell isn't going to have any Democrat uh, influence in the Libertarian Party. Speaking of butt hurt, how is your anus? Uh, in death, much recovered. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a soothing balm, but give him some witch hazel. Yeah, and so, you know, <laughs> we are, I mean, I'm just going to say, it. like, right now, Brett, you, and me are being, um, de it's it's uh, Saul Linsky tactics. We're being demonized yeah. so that they can... You know, when they get resoundingly beat and crushed, which they will, and that's a foregone conclusion, 
um, they can say that there was a conspiracy against them. Because I, I won't be as, uh, you know, I'm new. <laughs> I'm new. You've been in the party two weeks. And I warned everyone Wait, that you didn't want me in. Is Greg new? We might need to run him off. Yeah. <laughs> and feel free, because I, I told Chris May, I go, you, I'm not going to, I don't, I'm, I'm from a big party. We can have these disagreements, attack each other at the throat, and then go right back to being friends. Th- that and was that, actually- what, happened, Tashman, what happened yesterday, was it yesterday or two days ago? Uh, two days ago. Two, uh, two days yeah. ago, I took on the person that, and I don't bully first. If someone bullies the Chris because of stuff I do, I'm going to unblock them, and I am going to go for the jugular until I've attacked every single thing that makes you insecure to the point you threaten to leave the party, and I say, don't let the door hit you on the way out, <laughs> and I do it multiple times, and you keep threatening it, and why won't you just go? Why won't you go back? Part of me has to wonder if the if the Facebook culture is is to blame for this because we it is. Because I think it's a little bit because of the the, the pseudo anonymity the desensitization well, like well, it's just not being even able that. it's it's the echo chamber you know yep. like an information and, silo yeah 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 I mean use I, I and maybe I'm romanticizing you know the pre-internet days but I feel like yeah, there used to be a guy. time. Well, I mean, they, I feel like there used to be a time where we could have disagreements with our friends, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we could have like, okay, well, you know, you and I don't see eye to eye on this issue, but like, whatever, you're still a good drinking buddy. Uh, I mean, there's things going around Facebook now where like, hey, go see who, uh, which of your friends sub, uh, likes Donald Trump's page so you can go unfriend them. Right, right. right. I, I, the plethora of, of sources has created these information silos mm-hmm. and what happens is you never get exposed whereas before if it was just the three channels on NBC Nightly News everyone had the same information point and so yeah, you're right. used to all right. and so now though you get it from Fox. your liked pages and that's your information yeah uh, so well uh, and, and, I, and before we go on let me let me hit on something that, that Tim said we weren't we weren't sitting behind a keyboard and typing furiously yeah. at one another we were having conversations one on one where you can you can inflect the important things, you can sense tone, you can you can see when somebody's being sarcastic, you can be you can see when somebody's being authentic and real, and that's taken away when it's words on a screen. And, and it's a lot harder for me to be a jerk to you in front of you yes. than it is uh, to me do even if I've met you before and I know you well, it's much easier for me to be a jerk to you uh, online. Yes. So I, I, we've been accused of running libertarians off and not creating new libertarians. I'd be interested if any of our audience listening at hour 46 of this, if you would go to our Facebook page at We Are Libertarians or tweet at We Are Libertarians, we are the letter libertarians, and just say, listen, I'm a libertarian because of you guys. Go to our Facebook wall. Go to Greg's Facebook wall, my Facebook wall. Uh, go to the Spanking City Hall Facebook page and write it there. <laughs> I'd like to call for, I don't know, I, you know, being new to the party, I just have one request. Can we publish the results of the delegate count? Uh, usually it's held secret. Yeah. But Is there any ability to make those public? Delegate count, what do you mean? For the governor? Uh, the, the, the outcome? Mm-hmm. Uh, typically, to spare feelings, I've never seen a, an actual count published. Greg, how do you feel about feelings? I like to run them over like I'm driving the tank in Tiananmen Square. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have your field. Yeah. Greg, I, I love parliamentary procedure, and you have piqued my interest. I will research that. You <laughs> are. Because I feel like, here's what I feel like. I feel like they distort everything, the other side, Team Wallace. And it's not Jim, because I actually like Jim. It's his little minions that are, self, or that are delusional. What have you called them? Little minions? No. The Mean Girls of Liberty? Oh, yeah, the, the plastics <laughs> of the Libertarian Party. You know, we've got, uh, oh, I forget the main actor. Lindsay Lohan was in it. Yeah. Um, but they're the Mean Girls of Liberty, and they don't run on anything substantial. They run, they needed an enemy, they picked it. They call us purists, or, you know, and then they say we're childish. And then when I, I didn't attack first. I kept my thoughts to myself. But when you attack me or my friends... I'm going to go as hard as I can. I follow the NAP. If you break it, I nuke your country. Here's the thing with the uh, purity argument. Uh, I think that it's common, um, having <laughs> been in the Libertarian uh, yeah. Party and in the movement for a, quite a while. The Hidden now, Cloak Society? It is very, very, yes, exactly. It is very common for members of the two major parties to come in 
maybe with a little money, maybe with a little name recognition, and or the promise of a little money, and say, hey, I'm gonna run for the top of the ticket. Yeah. Because I'm going, I'm gonna make a name, but no one ever wonders why they're not at the top of the other ticket. Yeah. And libertarians um, are very quick to wonder, is this just an opportunistic grab? Is this another party trying to take over our party? Because you can say anything you want. We all know that already. You can say anything you want to compel someone to vote for you. The question is, what are you going to do when you get in that position? So when you kind of wander in at the last minute, into a party that already is running a candidate who has been a member of the party for quite some time, who has lived it, who walks the walk every day, and oh, by the way, doesn't have an enormous Google problem, then yeah, I mean, that of course, of course you're gonna feel maybe like the rest of the, you know, everybody else is concerned with purity because you look opportunistic. Yeah, I and will so say, maybe, I am a maybe... domestic abuse purist. I want to be on yeah. the record about that. <laughs> Crystal, that's actually a really great point. I mean, what company in the world could we, any of us walk into and say, and you know what? CEO. You know, There's... I I have found the light. Pepsi is the way to go. I'm quitting my Coca-Cola job, and I want to be the CEO. And, and frankly, this happened with Johnson. Johnson, and it happened with uh, it happened less a bar, I, actually. I experienced it when I joined the party <laughs> because I had ideas, and I was enthusiastic, and, and I was meeting, a, I didn't have the realism that I do. Right. I didn't have the, the view on sustainable growth. I didn't have, I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the scars from learning from my mistakes. I didn't have those things when I first joined the party party. I'd always been a libertarian. I've never been a D or an R. Um, but for me, when I first joined, I got a lot of pushback like, hey, hang on. You know, don't get too, you're, you're, you're too enthusiastic. Who the hell you're, do you think you are? You're doing too much. You're, you know, and, yeah. and for me, you know, I said, okay, fine. Let me, let me come up with the blueprint. I looked at how we could improve outreach. I took the time from my previous career um, experience when I would go into movie theaters and I would see, yeah, you could come in and change everything overnight but it's not gonna work because you have to see how the culture of that theater works. 21 irrefutable laws. 21 mm -hmm. irrefutable laws of leadership were yeah. a great way to look at that. That is a great book. And, yeah. so, and so when I joined the party and, and, and joined the establishment, let's be honest, I, I've been the operations director for the Libertarian Party of Georgia, executive director for the Libertarian Party of Georgia, I was chairman of the Libertarian State Leadership Alliance, I'm on the LNC now, I'm on the state central committee now, uh, I'm on my county executive board. I am the definition of the Libertarian Party establishment, if you look at my resume. But I've also been an activist. I've been a candidate. Uh, I've knocked on Door. 1,500 doors for my race. I didn't rely on volunteers to do the heavy lifting. I did it myself. But I was doing it so that I could see how we could improve rather than just postulating that my method was more efficient and if everybody would just do things my way, we would get there. I went out and did it. And that I think is the difference and one of the reasons that people have entrusted me to lead the party in some manner or some form or fashion. Uh, I moved to Indiana two years ago. I had a reputation that came with me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was because Chris was really uh, somebody that was uh, very complimentary of the work that he'd seen that I'd done. I was your cheerleader. Especially when I took all of Chris's ideas and made them better. <laughs> And the um, uniform is amazing. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I, I felt very welcome when I came to the Libertarian Party of Indiana right. because people knew, people knew who I was and I had a reputation and I think that helps. And unfortunately, there are people who come into the party with not as shining of a reputation and have not been as quickly welcomed. And I don't think that's a slam of Wallace. I think that's a general blanket statement because if you've been around the Libertarian Party for any time of period, sure. this is one of those cultural things that a, a new person who comes in, there's almost that, there's like a bit of, well, you guys are just the Libertarians and now you've got to catch like me, mm -hmm. so put me at the top of the ticket. We've Absolutely. seen, right. I mean, frankly, Gary Johnson did that. Yeah. You know, but it happened to be that he had the bona fides. Mm -hmm. he, he had the record. He had 
the membership record that everybody could, you know, he had the record as as the governor that vetoed 700 bills. And there was nothing looming over him. That was crazy. But th- we have over, I mean, Tim, in the last eight, nine years that you and I have worked together on Libertarian Party stuff, how many times have we had the promise of money, the promise of stature, the promise of connections? You know, you just get wary with it. Yeah. You, yeah, you just get so wary with it. Yeah, it, it happens all the time, and, and not even from the other two parties. Sometimes it's just a, a candidate who finally got off the couch. Yeah, who finally got off the couch and says, "I'm going to tear up the world," and he does a little bit, and then gets pissed off that we didn't like fill in the gaps for him, and then we never hear from him again. There's there's a lot of blaming party structure for individuals' failures. And that has happened, and let me tell you, Libertarian Party guy out there who's working your butt off, the Rodneys of the world, the Greg Greg Nolans of the world, Rodney Banker, who is a a great volunteer for the Libertarian Party of Indiana, Greg Nolan, fantastic guy, a guy like Rex Bell, the guy who's worked hard. Or even my buddy Nick Sarwark, who has been an activist in multiple states um, and is now the National Party Chair. You, you, uh, you're gonna... You're gonna. It's my girlfriend's twenty. Have I mentioned that? Uh, and Not in it, the last ten minutes. And it is. <laughs> it's been like almost an hour. It is. It is interesting to see. I'm thirty two, and it is interesting to see, from a removed perspective, somebody who is going through life and experiencing things for the first time, and thinking, "Wow, I'm glad that has happened to me five times since I was twenty, so I didn't have to go through it for the first time." Mm-hmm. And when you are in the Libertarian Party, you're going to get involved, and you're going to go through some things that happen for the first time, and you're going to go, gee, this really sucks. I don't know that I can do this. This feels really thankless. But you're going to get beaten five times and have that experience, and then you're going to have the one where you just go, holy cow. You know, you're, you're going to get the letter from a Michael Christensen that, that says, my whole opinion of domestic I don't think it was Michael that actually said that but another guy's my whole opinion of domestic violence is totally different now you know it's uh it, it just then you get letters like that where you go wow what I'm doing is really making an impact in an individual's life and that one person had the kindness I I managed the social media of a major mass media outlet 225,000 Twitter followers 225,000 Facebook followers Four million listeners. He think he famous. No, it, I'm saying they're famous. I'm just the guy running the social media, and so you get to, a to lot. To be clear, you're not talking about we are libertarians. No, okay. <laughs> one day. So I get a tremendous amount of inbound messages. Ninety percent are negative, because negative is easy. Mm-hmm. It yeah. doesn't take any oh, vulnerability yeah. to be a giant negative prick. Well, and not but only it that. takes vulnerability and discomfort in your personhood to be positive for some reason in sure. society. Well, you know, coming from the movie theater industry, the exhibition industry, went but as my previous career, you know, every complaint that you got, every ten, for about every ten complaints you got, you got one piece of praise mm-hmm. because it's much easier to complain about the long line or the messy bathroom than it is to say, you know, that employee that was serving me popcorn was awesome. They were super friendly, they were gregarious and outgoing. You know, it, it's much easier to be negative. And, it, and unfortunately, we've kind of rewarded the negativity. We've, we've made the we people- have too. Exactly, right. because the customer's always right, right? right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and while I understand the, the, the uh, mentality of that and, you know, how that can be beneficial, there is a point where you just have to say, "Hey, look, I can't jump through the hoops that you're that you keep moving higher and higher because let's face it, I just can't jump that high." Yeah. It, there's a point where there's an it's no longer economically feasible for you to placate that customer because you're no longer making money. Yep. That translates very easily to politics. If you've ever been in a retail or service industry, you totally understand. There's a point where you just have to say, "Hey, look, I can't jump through, I can't do what you're asking me to do anymore because I'm going to lose more than I'm going to gain from you. Yeah. So, and, there's, and that trade-off 
is something that you have to be on the lookout for. And it, it goes to what Greg said earlier, where you're looking at, well, this person brings this in, this person brings this in, what do we lose by having that? And it's so a hidden you, cost. Yeah, it is a hidden cost because yeah. you are gonna lose people. If you have somebody that's awesome and is bringing people in, there are still gonna be people that are like, you know, that guy, I just don't like them. Um, I, can't, I can't count on one hand, I can barely count on two, how many meetings I've had with millionaires that want to use libertar the Libertarian Party for their own gain or they want to change the Libertarian Party to be their party. Right. And they say, hey, I, I want this to happen. And if you do this, I'm going to bestow all of these resources upon you. Right. So in closing on this subject, before we move on to a different sort of inclusiveness, if you're that guy out there who is just working hard or you're that gal who's out there working hard, and it feels thankless, and you're getting 10 complaints for uh, 20 complaints, let's be honest, for every one attaboy. Because it is a thankless job to be in any kind of volunteer position, especially in the Libertarian Party, where we are woefully lacking in emotionally intelligent people. Yes. We are, <laughs> I, I, I hate to say this, but I love you accountants. Mm. I love you programmers. I love all my little INTJ friends. But there is, you just don't have the gifts that us ENFJs and EF whatever's and ESTPs or whatever Greg is like you just don't sometimes see that 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 you know that that human need for attaboy there is that an INTP feels very disregarded that's right there used to be a great story about uh, Harry Truman when he was in the Missouri State House like at the state level and it was he came home after a really crappy day at the State House and lost a vote for which he was championing and he looks, sits down his, uh, sits down his briefcase on the uh, kitchen desk or kitchen table, and looks at his wife, and he goes, "Bess, why do you think it that only people that send letters are the sons of bitches that can look a stamp?" <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, right? Because you only hear the criticism. Yeah, and you so know? let me tell you, for for every ten people that complain, there's probably one other person who feels the same way about that. But for the one person that sends you a positive letter, there's hundreds of people that feel that way that just never said a word yeah. and so you need to think about ratios and percentages and realize that the people that are being mean to you and criticizing you have emotional problems that they haven't dealt with themselves and if you're in a position of leadership you don't even have to be in a, in a position of leadership if you're around your local volunteer group or if you're around other people in your life people are starved for for gratitude for encouragement for positivity, and it costs you absolutely nothing to actually say out loud, hey, you did a really good job with this, thank you. That costs you nothing, and it means the world to those other people. And just like your donations to We Are Libertarians, when you do that, you know what that is? That says, thank you, I value you, I value what you guys do, and we appreciate it, so we're gonna do more. So, we're gonna talk about a different kind of inclusiveness now. Uh, you know, there is, I had a listener write in, his name is Mike Williams, a friend of mine who has encouraged me not to be such a fat ass. Uh, he'll just message me every every couple of days and go, did you go to the gym today? And I ignore him. And uh, That's a good friend. He is, he's a good guy. Hey, did you go to the gym today? I did not. No, but he did eat pizza. Oh, I ate that. At a pizza. Uh, <laughs> so, my life coach, Tim McGuire, bringing beer and pizza over. Um, hey, I'm just going to be happy when hey, I can work out again. Yeah. That's right. He, he uh, was violently anally raped in Purdue. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, never mind. Uh, so, another type of inclusive. So, Mike went to Norway, and Mike made a stop off in Brussels before he uh, flew out here. And he said, I was in the Brussels airport. Uh, a Muslim man and woman had lost their passports, and he started violently and loudly praying to Allah to fix the situation. And he said, I've never been more terrified in my entire life. Because it was like two days ago, so it was after the t attacks. He was like, oh God. I was like, you're a racist. But, <laughs> you know, Europe is really overwhelmed with Syrian refugees, and it's something that we are, we are uh, seeing a lot about. And hey, if you know or are a Syrian refugee want to talk to you, uh, so hit us up, because I'd like to know what that process is actually like. Uh, so, Greg, what 
what is the cost of inclusiveness in, in EU? Why don't you kind of give us some facts and give us some background as we set up this discussion? Well, like Germany's, ha and like that's, I guess my point is, you know, I, always, I don't try to be um, a contrarian, but like liberty's super, liberty, libertarianism is hugely important to me and I want to see its growth and adoption. Unfortunately, that means dealing with people who aren't libertarians. Right. And so one of the things we've benefited from, and it's going to be important to stay aware of this as we preach this message, is um, we've had an environment conducive to accepting a libertarian message and how it affects things. And that isn't always the case, because libertarianism isn't going to work in, in a post-9-11 you know, year after world. People want a Patriot Act. People want spying. They want surveillance. They shouldn't. That's the reality of the situation. They are legitimately scared. 3,000 people died. <clears throat> so they immediately want to target individuals. I mean, the appeals are the worst among us. They want to target individuals who mimic patterns of the people who committed a terrorist act. They want to feel safe again. Right. And so one thing about, and this is where, um, this is where I guess it ties to my lack of inclusiveness with new party entrants <laughs> and even excommunication of existing party members is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And if you look at the EU right now, there were fringe, discredited National Socialist parties that are now hugely rising, especially in Europe. Um, right now, the alternative for Germany, the AFD, uh -oh. is, a, is a party uh -oh. that had, pre well, no, seriously, had previously, prior to 100,000 Syrian refugees coming in, had never pulled above 2%. Mm -hmm. They just took 11.5% of the vote. Normal, suburban, you know, you're, right. you're, you're, you're suburban Republican, suburban Democrat that doesn't experience the devastation in their daily lives but want to do something about it. Well, people think that uh, Trump votes are, like, just white, white is right, but Trump gets a bigger percentage of the vote in, high, in areas with high percentages of minorities. He's the highest polling Republican candidate for Hispanics, and he's advocating building a wall. Right, like it, it, it's so <laughs> it's there, counterintuitive. It is counterintuitive. It seems like oh well, he should just be you know uh, polling the polling just people who have never met a black person in their life. No, the, the point, and I'm not saying that like th that racial tension for some reason, and I don't know what yet, is compelling to people to vote for Trump, for right. instance. And like with the with the Muslim thing. Um, it's tough in a world where such acts do happen, like a Brussels type event, to, I don't think it's the right role for libertarians to issue comment right there. And I only, it's the right role to advocate to people's best interests, and this is, we're better than that, we have to be better than that, because that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. There's a practical blowback that comes from telling someone the right thing to do in a period where they're in a raw emotive state. And so with like what we're seeing right now, the only thing that allowed the rise of Donald Trump is telling American manufacturing workers that this is the way the world's going. Here's a tax credit to go back to school and learn a new skill. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. Sorry. Turns out that's a pretty big voting base. Turns out that's a pretty big voting base that's looking for someone that doesn't sell logic. They're looking for someone that sells emotion. You know, and someone that captures their fire and will say what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's the political rally win right now. And that's why Rand gets blown away in Iowa by Ron's old supporting caucus member, or, you right. know, supporting members. They literally all back Trump, which you would think that's, a, that's not possible. How is the revolution voter supporting Donald Trump? It's because someone came and, and swayed him and seduced him. And so the tie into in, um, inclusiveness is, uh, it sounds horrible, but if what you're going to include in the right context ends up creating a blowback, it's counterproductive. And that's the case with, you know, just growing a party and accepting anybody becomes counterproductive because then you're actually doing a disservice to the existing members. And like in the EU, you have a bunch of Germans, they have a social welfare state, they take Syrian refugees, all of a sudden they have a budget crisis. Right. All of a sudden, the right wing, you know, um, son of, or I guess, offshoot and redevelopment of the National Socialist Party just got 11.5% of the vote. That isn't a good thing for any libertarian anywhere. No. So the only reason I bring it up is, you know, open borders, you know, um, 
winning elections is the only way we, I, I think we're going to bring about liberty and libertarianism. I don't think, yeah. I don't think a, an overthrow is going to happen. So, and so my, my point is we need to, in times like attacking a Donald Trump, when those are the former people that supported Ron, that's debilitating to us because we've worked so, you know, we've worked to build liberty. What? Nothing. 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 No. Okay. Don't look down. No, it's not, not you. Um, wow. Uh, is, I guess just be careful. Don't just, you know, I get criticized for not being all the time open borders, but what I really am worried about is not so much open borders, it's the blowback where we just set back libertarianism from being adopted for another 60 years. <laughs> We're fucking with Greg. Yeah. <laughs> he's doing, he's such a professional. Oh, he's What's trying that? so hard. I know, I am. But, um, so, yeah, that's all it is. Is that, so, you know, are you saying, are you saying that be careful about the open borders or? Uh, I am. Like, I am. Okay. I'm saying that any, like, rejecting the, you know, we can't win at just libertarians vote. And we're doing our best to create as many libertarians as we can, but our sure. real thing is getting more libertarian ex- sympathetic voters. And so, like, a lot of people in the Libertarian Party love to bash Trump. A lot of people do. And well, I feel yeah. uncomfortable. No, I, no, I don't care. Because yeah. it doesn't matter to me. Like, right. It honestly doesn't matter. Your opinion is your opinion. I'm not going to go on Facebook and make a post saying that because Chris Spangle doesn't like Trump, he's hurting new entrance to the Libertarian Party. Please do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you do not have copyright permission to use my <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to commit IP rape. Um, uh, and if I can just interject here, is your basis for that like the, in Germany the, the fact that they have a welfare state and it's starting to collapse? No, my, well, no, no, he's talking about the rise of yeah, yeah, essentially but, but, the new Nazis it, because they have. Because they but, took it, but, but, in so so, but it sounds like it's a it's a backlash to the fact that their their social structure is, is failing because they're taking in more people into a into a no, welfare that, state. That's what the people are justifying their okay. dislike. That's how they're selling it. Well, I'm not racist. Just look at the budget deficit. Okay. Well, it's the same people that say, yeah, I, I'm not. the same thing in the UK with UKIP. Yep, yep. exactly. Yeah. Right. It is exactly yeah. the same thing. They've, they've been very open um, and inclusive, and then all of a sudden, as a reaction, you see the people who say, wait a minute, maybe this isn't, I'm not really sure, and then they have somebody that's very... Charismatic. Very charismatic and says, hey, this is the wrong direction. You know, if you support us, we're going to fix this problem because it's it, it's all about fixing the problem and the people that can message that, regardless of the situation, are going to be the ones that benefit. And then we're set back. Right. Heavily. Like, so... so, like, so Donald Trump's rise that? sets us back so far. So you don't see that as just a, that we need to get better with our messaging? And, and I mean... Because rash, ration and logic to no, a pissed no, no, off no. crowd creates it's, 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 it's not ration and logic. It's pointing out... Um, it's pointing out, hey, the people that did this to you, the people that ran the, these companies off, are the people that you're supporting right now. So sort of the Bernie message, which is, here's the correct enemy, but here's the correct solution, as opposed to, although that's very difficult when you say, well, hey, we're going to, we're going to, it's the 1% scrutiny, so we're just going to cut government and give them more. Well, no, really no, 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 no. It, it, it is the one percent screwing you. So we're going to stop giving them the tools to screw you by we're, by giving them the keys to the government. Right. We're we're taking away the government's power to reward the one percent. And that's, exactly. that should be the message. Yes. And on that, work, out of and that people. on that one, that works. Yeah, that doesn't work on immigration. I disagree. Yeah. I I completely disagree. How do you message immigration to a, a people that? And this is this is now scientifically backed. You know, Harvard Trump's entire campaign is based off a Harvard study that came out said the number one driver of inequality in the world, or in the United States, was the passage of NAFTA and un, uh, illegal immigration's downward effects on entry level wages, because it's create it's flooded a market of new wage participants that are undocumented that'll work for lower prices and off the books, so it's driven well, the wages an- down. The answer is immigration reform, so that they're not stuck in the middle. Well, now you're not open jobs. borders, Tim. But the, but the problem What's is you're, now you're not open borders, Tim. You want to? What are you talking about? Want to, no, we no, don't no. believe in borders. Borders are just things. Yeah, yeah, but but you're just you're you're, you're specifically <laughs> saying undocumented, which necessitates a borders, uh, you know, a border and a whole process. The the whole fact that they're undocumented, it, 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 they're, they've created this shadow economy. Uh, where they're undocumented, so they can't work, you know, li- legally, and they can't necessarily, you know, move up in the world. You're so, where I am, and you don't know it, because I'm going to come as you as a libertarian. Okay. Why should they have to be documented? 
Why can't they just live where they want to live? What? Okay. All, why does okay. the government have okay. any? Uh, okay. uh, no, but you see what I'm saying? <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but what, what you're no, arguing? You, you, I'm arguing the same thing you are. Okay, go ahead. We're on the same. No, we're on the same side. Yeah, okay. That's what you don't okay. get. I'm, I'm okay. giving okay. you a hard time. No, fuck you. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you a hard time because that, that's what I've encountered. Is like, all right, accept all these Syrian refugees. Go to Dearborn, Michigan. See how much they love liberty. See how much they love voluntary association. Well, uh, it's Dearbornistan, and I, and I don't. They're not even they're they're Shias, so they're not like the you know the Sunni radicals. So it's not an, even an issue. Yeah, but, but if you look at different. if you look at most immigrants, uh, once you get a lot of times with the first immigrant, uh, the first generation, and if not the first generation, the second and third definitely they become very Americanized. They become mm-hmm. very you know uh, they, because we have a we have a culture and we have a um, a republic that is set up in such a way that uh, they're integrated in our society. Listen to the Mac Guire. Yeah. No, um, I know. I mean, you know, I, I, my, I agree with you. I believe there should be a process for assimilation where they come in work legally, and then they're second to their right. generation. But would you agree that 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 process needs? I'm to saying be that's not libertarian easier. at all. What are you talking about? If you make it easier, uh, the thing How is, is that not you can't go from where we are easier. to completely open borders. Because yeah. that's what you're talking about. You're talking about flipping a switch. I am. The thing is, do you want everybody undocumented? Like, is that what you're thinking? Like, I want no. everyone documented. What, I, what I'm, I'm saying is, I'm he wants to build a wall. Yeah, yeah. No. I think a, I think a wall and in, in trade reform are the best shot libertarians have at not getting burnitarians, because the danger I see ahead of us is right now there's a white middle aged po- or you know elderly baby boomer population and middle aged population without like college degrees, no without college degrees that are blue labor that have been asked to go learn a new skill, whose factory got shut down because they passed NAFTA and now there's trade routes open who go to earn a twelve dollar an hour job and find out that the economy will only support nine okay, but because there's a bunch problem, of books. That, that problem isn't is isn't immigration. There I mean that it is. Pro- people don't it's no. the hidden cost. No 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 it's not. It, what the real problem is is because all these all these companies are moving overseas because because uh, our tax, tax uh, structure our tax structure is, is inhospitable you know what, you know what in the, this country. You know what the actual rate of payment is for corporate top fortune five hundred corporate taxation? Two percent. They get enough incentives, and they're able to manipulate accounting rules. Right, they're able, but they have to pay for that. So it, it you're not fully looking at the cost right. when you say two. Lobbying is the greatest investment. The, any lobbying, the, tax the attorneys, other, loophole, loophole finders. Oh no doubt, but they don't. They can't show that to of course not. investors. Of course the, not. The other, the other great problem with uh, manufacturing jobs is is technology and the automation of uh, of all this stuff. It's it's made our lives better, but it's made a lot of these jobs obsolete. Obsolete. Then that's great, because that's the logical argument, and it's true. Sell that to a guy that just went from making $33 an hour at the Union Stamping Plant here in Indianapolis, but just that now goes yeah, back to the economy at 12. Yeah, did you say this guy is also a baby boomer? No. I thought I heard you say that. So, like, the early baby yeah. boomer has... Okay, so here's what I wonder, as a millennial, why they haven't planned for their retirement. Go tell that to an angry mob. I am an angry mob. <laughs> it's yeah. hit on the rubber mat. <laughs> We're good. Excellent. We, yeah, we just had a, a no, I, I push, over here. No, 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 and no. It's 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 Jeez. fine. But like, I'm just saying. All I all I would say is always be cognizant of the message you give to an angry mob. Because mm-hmm. right now this mob wants trade protection, right? Or they actually they don't even they just want non currency manipulation. So they're on the exact same equal like you know with China not they tax us forty five percent for every good that's brought into their country that we give to them. We don't do that to them. Hence, where they manipulate the currency so it's cheap to make products there. And they have a rural population that doesn't, you know, they're coming from farming to an industrial economy. So they don't have, you know, years of loan debt built up. They can support themselves and move on a cheaper currency, labor intensive. In the United States, it looks unfair when you say, we're the world's reserve currency. We don't have the option of manipulating it like they do. Because if we do, anyone that's pegged their currency to us, it throws off their economy and creates the Arab Spring, which is what happened when we did QE right after um, the mortgage crisis. And so we don't have the options. So the wor- least we can say to an American worker is we're going to be an equal playing field when right now all they're calling for is an equal playing field. If we ignore it, it turns an equal outcome. And that's ballgame for libertarianism. Because these people support Donald Trump right now, but there's also a pretty big segment that support the same things for Bernie Sanders says, but says them differently. And if it turns into outcome where everyone gets the same regardless of work, we'll never be able to sell liberty at all. 
You brought up the wall. I, I don't understand how wall building, like a physical, actual, literal wall, does, oh, it does anything to really help oh, it does nothing a to job. It. No, that's a political tool. It's it's a 14... You're a political tool. <laughs> I know. I am. And I, and I know it, 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 it makes people upset, but I'm really worried, like, if it isn't the Trump's message that goes through... So and are, these people are ignored for another eight years. Are are you just arguing that we need to be better about our messaging, or are you saying that we need to be careful about letting immigrants in? Is that I, I'm saying like on immigration? Yeah. Anytime there's an uh, an angry mob, you can't go and tell them the truth, or else they're gonna hate you. You create an enemy. Okay. And they it all it does is send them to Trump faster because he looks like their advocate. And Trump's not as horrible for us as Bernie Sanders is because Donald Trump... Ooh, I don't know about... Okay, go ahead. I mean, he's the last non, non-intervention policy person, but... What he's advocating for Non-intervention is, is being used pretty loosely there. When it he's is. talking about somebody who wants to blow people off the map and keep people out of the country, ban and an entire religion, yeah. and start a trade war. But, but see, that's not what he said. He actually said, until we have a new betting process in place. That was the full quote. So, I mean, that's what I mean, like... I'm not saying I I I don't I mean you support who you support and I don't want to tell anyone to change because I'm a libertarian too, but you do have to worry that you have a crowd to sell to. So so you're basically saying ignore the stupid people, stop trying to correct them, exploit them. Okay. Yeah. Sell, by, by, sell to them. By they can still be sold by a fair playing field, which actually isn't anti-libertarian. Right. It's the equal application of the law and everyone from the same position. We're working right now in our economy from an unequal playing field because we're burdened by being the world's reserve currency, so we can't manipulate as much. And NAFTA, we're the, we're the in charge of trade deals. Bittner? This feels so much like the the Southern strategy, the the Rothbard Rockwell. Let's reach out to the the kind of. I don't want to reach out to him. I'm saying don't don't antagonize him. Don't, you know, like, because a lot of libertarians are killer, killers of Donald Trump, but his supporters can't be reached with any logic right now. Let it die down. I don't think they don't create agree. enemies. I, yeah. I agree with that. Well, and, and okay. one of the biggest okay. things that yeah. we're seeing right okay. now with, with, with Trump is he's running the largest, amazingly sustainable, earned media campaign I've ever seen in my life. But all of that is because everybody is looking at the train wreck. Everybody is pointing Why? to it's rubbernecking. Right, it it's exactly what it is. They want to see they Trump's still around because they people keep talking about him. What are we doing right now? We're talking about him because he's the he's different. He's fascinating. Right, and, and that people are are in the media in the public. They realize that there's something wrong there, but they are just. It's like when you pass by a traffic accident, you know that something bad happened. Or bad is happening, but you still stop, slow d- or slow down, and look rather than continuing on your your path. And I would agree, but he's got the leading delegate count. But that's the thing: if you ignore him, yeah, then you lose. He loses his momentum. He loses the earned media. He then has to politic in the real political world. Mm-hmm. He has to have a ground game, mm-hmm. which he does not have. He has to have offices across the country, which he does not have. His campaign is him in the media. It's fascinating and amazing to watch because it has not happened in a very long time. And it will, it will probably never happen And it will never happen again because you're never going to have the populist moment with the guy who has the charisma and can say nothing. And people stand up and cheer. Well, here's why it will never happen again. is because Donald Trump was built in the 80s and 90s. Yes. When ever, there was consolidated media, consolidated lanes, consolidated media, for it, uh, basically. Social media, hundreds of outlets of news didn't exist. It, it, it can never happen again because he was such a broad figure. He was born in a time that will never exist again. Like, as people from 30 to 35... We are the last people who understand what it was like to not have cell phones growing up and, and how much of a game changer that is to not have uh, to not have smartphones, not have computers, not have the internet. Not have Friendster. Not, not have Friendster, not have social networking, not have those media silos. We remember when Fox was launched. 
Fox didn't exist. Right. Let alone Fox News, you know? So so he w- he w- became a, a cultural icon at a time when you could become a cultural icon. You really can't... I mean, there's of course there's the Beavers of the world. But that's not really his success. But what I'm saying is the reason he will never exist again, there will never be another Trump figure that can command the media in the way that Trump has, right. is because no one can be Trump again. Right. You know, and like that's like, but my my concern is this: this is a big ass portion of the American electorate, yeah. huge, that huge. right now is asking for an opportunity at an equal uh, equality of opportunity. They don't. They're not saying I demand this income. They're saying I want an equal playing field with the Chinese, you know, manufacturer, the competition, whoever can. Right, I can un- I can understand that. Right. That's what and that's what he's advocating. Okay. That's the success because if it turns into well, we're already screwed. You know, our government screwed us. I'm going to go vote for Bernie because he's guaranteeing me that I'm going to get $2,400 a month no matter what. So, no matter which, which is what, what, if which is, libertarianism's screwed. Which is forever. what the Bernie what the Bernie people want. They want an equality, equality of outcome. Them. Right. No, they want equality of outcome. They want yeah, to... No, no. I, not all. I, but, not all. But a socialist want... A socialist is the... They're in belief. Democratic socialism. The welfare state is big enough; it guarantees you you'll never enter into a poverty situation. Right. That's a quality of outcome. The Trump voter is saying, "Give me a, a fair playing field to go make thirteen dollars, fourteen dollars an hour, eighteen dollars an hour against the global marketplace." Which is ironic because he didn't come from a. <laughs> I know it is, but I'm the, saying the, the, it's the reality equal play, or the the level playing field. I have, right, I, and I I'm just saying, unfortunately, it's the reality of who he swayed because if it if the tide changes and it becomes the Bernie person that demands twenty four hundred dollars a month and a universal income. We can't sell liberty to that crap. But the other side to that is, he's he's got a ceiling. Oh yeah. And the you know what we're seeing now, and, and we were actually talking about this at the office today, is his ceiling is one that is not. He's so polarizing that the and Hillary on the other side is so polarizing that there's no way that they are actually representing. It's kind of like what we see on the first ballot for certain people within the Libertarian Party. Right. They can get 45%, and you guys know who exactly what I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about. Mm-hmm. They can get 45% on the first ballot, and then their influence diminishes with each successive ballot. Right. And what we're seeing with Trump is he's winning states with a plurality. Mm-hmm. He's winning states with 35% of Republican voters, or people who identify enough to pull a Republican ballot. Actually, in 30% are new Democratic, first-time Republican registrants. Yeah. Right, but but what they're doing is they're identifying as Republicans in a, yeah. in a party that is diminishing. Democrats' party is diminishing in terms of people who identify that way. And so they're participating in the primary process because they found somebody, but at the end of the day, he's still only getting 35% of a party that's only a third of the American electorate. And that's only the people showing up for primaries. Right. And, like, I, honestly, like, I don't even care, like, so much about that is that I care about, one, it tells us that because his supporters are open to an equal playing field argument, that's the libertarian argument. We don't advocate corporate interest over anybody or someone gets special status or doesn't. We advocate, we advocate exactly equal, equal playing field. And right now there's a big voting block that accepts that. That's what he's been able to organize around. Right. The irony of the whole Trump phenomenon is that we do first pass the post voting. I, I hate to be the guy that talks about different voting systems because so many people are just completely confused when you say something like instant runoff or approval voting. And But in all honesty, the best way for America to have stopped the Trump phenomenon is if we had a different voting system, mm-hmm. because you'd be able to you'd be able to rank your choices, or you'd be able to say these are the people that are acceptable to me, and you wouldn't have somebody who's only getting thirty five percent of a third of the electorate. Well, we just don't have a two party system anymore. If you look at Hillary, Bernie, Trump, Cruz, Kasich, Marco Rubio, which I think is you know, great, Gary Johnson, more even, more viewpoints is going is better. Yeah, we just don't have a two party system. We have a multiple party system that are being squeezed into the two parties because of the two parties breaking the whole system. Right. It's like the girl who can't wear the jeans that she thinks she's that size, so she's got to lay down and you know use a pair of flyers to pull up the zipper because Chris, that's kind of what we're doing in the. Crystal, I'm triggered. How about you? Yeah. I mean, oh. What? That was kind of triggering. I'm I mean, always triggering. I'm her. Especially triggered. I, I feel overly triggered right now. 
I'm sorry I took this hit off into a tangent. Um, no, that's, that's my what we wanted. <laughs> no, I mean, my only point is that it isn't a good thing to ignore this angry mob because of what they want for us. Cause we, right. And I'm not saying we support libertarians. I'm saying that there are a bunch of disgruntled white middle-aged voters who vote, show up on primary days that he is courting and bringing with him. I, I, I they're see. not first. They're not Republicans. And the it's easy to look at it right now and say, God, he's not libertarian. He is negative for libertarianism. we got to stop him. Problem is, he brings a big part of voters that you're going to say, listen, I'm not going to give you what you're advocating for an outlet. So what I'm hearing Greg say is, if you're down ballot, you're not the presidential candidate, and you're trying to get elected or at least improve your election results, is don't attack Trump. Down ballot. Yeah. I, I think I think Because I just don't want the United States to... If, if, the, if this group's ignored again... They're going to become outcome. They're going to demand the quality of outcome because they've been denied the equality of opportunity to earn a living. So a based set, on government created it, right? So I think I think his point is is valid. Just in that, if you're a candidate or you're a libertarian, we and I am so guilty of this, and we as at we are libertarians are guilty of this too. I've always said that libertarians are a lot of change and not enough hope. You know, and you have to have hope with change you have to explain you know i i tune into some of those podcasts that we were ragging on earlier and it's all about well you know libertarians have been saying this for 30 years and had anybody just listened and we had changed it then then we wouldn't nobody have nobody likes i told you so no, no it's no oh, the bottom line is it's if, counterproductive it reinforces the opposition if if you are talking about libertarianism in terms of here's why it benefits you here's the positive direction that we could move and you fill your bucket so full of libertarian hope that you leave no room for Donald Trump sucks, then it's going to benefit us all. If Ron Paul had said, I'm for the American workers, so that the American worker stands in the exact same position as the Chinese kid that's in working 14 hours, that's libertarian. Right. I'm saying there are messaging lessons to learn in a group of people that might be sympathetic to it long term because if they're ignored again, we're screwed. You can't, can't. The reason there isn't libertarianism in Europe is because you can't sell it because they have a social welfare state that will never be overturned. Right. If it happens here, if there's equality outcome guarantees at certain levels, it's you, done. You you can have a, a certain level of a social welfare state and still implement uh, a, a libertarian. I think you have universal income with a libertarian state. A absolutely, and I, you know, and there's but been don't days, go saying that. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there, there have been days where I've said, you know what, if we're going to have a uh, welfare state, which we do in this country, okay, fine, let's make it. It has let, to be let, equally let, applied. Let, let, let's have harm reduction, you know. And, and not just the people who are really good at filling out forms yeah, and standing in yeah, line. absolutely. Right. Equally yeah. applied. Like a universal income, it creates competition. If every country has to offer better benefits in order to compete for citizens, that's really libertarian. And yeah. it boosts the best outcome for countries competing if yeah. that's the framework we're in. And so, like, I guess, like, you know, I, I, I'm just saying, don't think that beating Donald Trump and ignoring an angry mob is going to make it any easier, because the next thing no. these people are going to want is an outcome guarantee that Bernie Sanders is ready to court, and then it's, well, if there were just less government in your life, you wouldn't need that $2,400 a month that he's promising you. Oh, God, yeah. All right, well, let's wrap it up, then. Uh... Tim, Crystal, what we do here at the end is we give everybody a chance to talk about whatever you may have missed, shameless self-promotion, whatever. You can talk about anything. You can talk about squids if you want to. I know you're into that. <laughs> what about squad goals? Can we talk about that? <laughs> I don't know. I just was worried I had a nosebleed. But uh, this, this, podcast Did I been, die? <laughs> this, this podcast has been so intense it made my nosebleed. Uh, so let's, let's give uh, an old regular, old faithful here. Let him go first so he can he can show you two kids how it works. Brett Bittner? Oh, well, you know, I'm all about this, the shameless self-promotion. Um, take the World Smallest Political Quiz, theadvocates.org slash quiz. Uh, be, be part of the cool kids, the 23 million people who've taken it online, uh, the hundreds of thousands more who've taken it on paper. Um, and uh, connect with me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bittner for Liberty. Um, if you need a speaker for a libertarian or a liberty themed event, I am available to do so. Uh, I was just in Chicago uh, earlier this week talking to America's Future Foundation uh, at the Chicago chapter. 
and we had a really, really good time. Um, and uh, find me on Twitter. I'm at Brett Bittner. And I guess that's it. You know, he does all the speaking, Greg. Why don't we get to do speaking? What? I, I, I'm just, I look at Brett Bittner, and he goes out and does speaking. Why aren't we allowed to go out and speak? You don't get invited to speak? No. Do you? Yeah. What? Yeah. When? You guys should do speaking I'm the keynote engagements. on, uh, on. Take April, it from the uh, April 9th at the Henry Delaware um, Rush. Rush County <sighs> Convention. Wayne County Convention. Yeah. I'm going to be there. I got my ticket. Yeah. This is outrageous. Nobody asks me to speak. I'm just saying, listen, if you uh, want... We both asked you to speak. Two years ago. Yeah, well, we that was, heard you speak. That was, well, <laughs> around here, I'm just saying, I just think that... So what listen, you're saying I, is you want to go to places like Colorado and Kentucky and I Georgia would go to, and Florida, Tennessee, hell yeah. Texas, Chicago. As long as it doesn't cost me money, I will come and speak to you for free. Hey, I waive my honorarium for libertarian groups and college... Uh, student groups. Oh God, and I'm so much better at speaking than he is. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know how you speak. I'm I've got the speak. best words, Chris. The best. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. <laughs> the best words. Quit putting your big hands in my face. Uh, all right. <laughs> Crystal. I would like to promote pugs and other small dogs. Yes. And no. Um, the well, Instagram of a certain. Pug. Yeah, sure. That. And I don't know. What else is big in my life? The Race Wars podcast? That's funny. You, you like Race Wars? That. Oh, it's, it's a, really a, good it's a really funny podcast. It's uh like it's it's Kurt Metzger and Sherrod Small and uh-huh. they're both very funny. Sherrod Small, some people might know from um uh, Fox. He does a lot of work stuff on Fox News and Fox well, Business. And, yeah. yeah, he's done some red eye stuff, and he's on Kennedy Show a lot. And Kurt Metzger writes for Amy Schumer Show, and uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of fun. It's you know Metzger's a libertarian, so it can be very very fun to listen to sometimes. So I don't know. I got nothing going on, so I have to talk about other people's stuff. <laughs> That's so, fine. That's yeah. what we're here for. Tim McGuire. Well, just to follow up on our last conversation, uh, Greg, Greg, if what you're saying is we need to do better, better messaging, I'm always on board with better messaging, and 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 I, I agree with you there. Uh, but I do believe a uh, not not quite open borders, but like uh, pretty open borders. I think that's our uh, pathway to prosperity. Oh, so in this so country. am I. Where I want to go yeah. is open borders. Okay, okay, cool. No, so, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, like, and, and, and preaching I, open borders when he's yeah, doing no, this is, is kind of so. I, I just I just wanted to put that out there. That yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree that messaging is always important. But as far as uh, you know, I'm not going to do uh, too much shameless self promotion. I know um, you're. I know you. Know, you're going to. Don't yeah, even. Yeah. No. 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 I mean. I mean. I. Uh, you know. I. I, I do. Uh, I do help people uh, 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 keep more of their own money, which uh, all libertarians uh, probably like. So if anyone is interested in uh, um, learning how to keep more of your own money, please have uh, Chris Mangle uh, get a hold of me. Tim McGuire, the person who teaches you tax evasion. No, no, no. no. I don't want to be, I don't want to just be responsible for you for well, your, you know, for your all schemes. All right. Well, uh, tell people that again. Uh, Indie Tim thirty three at uh, gmail dot com is my. Oh, that's uh, brave. Yeah, you know it's i n d y t i m three three at gmail dot com, uh, or three one seven three seven two six four three six is dude. my personal. Cell no, phone. No. I'm putting You're it not going to get a oh, single wow. business related <laughs> inquiry. Hey, you know what? I, uh, I've got I'm, call I'm already ID planning. And, and I'm not uh, and I'm not afraid to use it. But I, I, I do want to take a moment and talk about my my good friend Mark Rutherford, who is running for Libertarian National Chair. Uh, this man is going to bring the uh, the Libertarian Party into the 21st century. Uh, his uh, website is mwrutherford2016.com. And uh, we're uh, his campaign's actually doing a money bomb event on April fourth. That's this coming Monday, um, and uh, and all donations received on that day will uh, be uh, uh, doubled by a, ma- a matching donor. And uh, if you're here in uh, Central Indiana, come join us at the Animal Club that night at seven p.m. Uh, for an after party. And uh, we'll have Mark on next week, so Mark's going to stop by and give us his vision. For is the this National party. is this campaign manager coming on? Uh, we can have her on if you want. Oh, she's she's the one that told me he was. So, oh. I just assumed she was coming as well. I'm sure if you asked nicely, Cat would have no problem. She got nothing to do. Oh, oh no, I just was curious. I didn't know if they were I, both I, coming on. 
No, I asked you for. I asked you before I booked them. Remember? Oh, I know she, but you Rutherford, or yeah, but then like she was the one that confirmed it, so I just oh, didn't okay. even know. Right. But good, good friends of the show and great people. I was just didn't know who all was going to be on. I don't know. Just uh, just them. They're they're going to step by for an interview, and then we'll uh, proceed with our normal shenan- shenanigans. Our establishment things. Yeah, this is a whole establishment thing. Basically, uh, we got called out for not supporting Wallace by Wallace on Rob Kendall's radio show. We, we talked about this, but just so you're aware. Uh, and it's because I don't want him at the top of the ticket because of his Google problem, and he said it was because he I believe he's not pure enough. We would rather die with absolute purity it, uh, than uh, accept a single ounce of pragmatism. In integrity, as opposed to... And so... Which is not the case, because neither of us have integrity. I just spent 30 minutes advocating maybe we shouldn't have such open borders. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went on Facebook and just explained that, no, I'm, here's why I'm not supporting him, and it's because of this issue, and uh, then we got called the establishment. So we're just running with it. Don't get the idea that there's a libertarian establishment, because there isn't. If you, if you make $10 an hour at Wendy's, and you show up to a meeting four times, you're a libertarian establishment. Okay, it's a party of doers, so just show up unless you're a conspiracy theorist, right, Greg? Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right, Gregory? Uh, no, I would say, you know, I think it's incredible to look at what you guys have accomplished in the time, you know, the Libertarian Party, because I am new, and now you really have built something that's looked at as a platform to exploit by outsiders. Yes. And that means you have to be, you, up the game in the vetting process. It just simply means that. And that's a sign of progress. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, it means that you have a resource that other people want to target. And when that's the case, it's your property, you know, kind of communally, I guess. But protect your ballot access. Protect your ballot access. Don't, you know, it isn't a crime to say, I'm sorry. I don't want the ham operator or the ham radio operator out of his, you know, back of his pickup truck in Arizona. Right to run in this Senate seat. Because there's a very real chance of losing that yeah. ballot access exactly. by picking the wrong candidate. Association matters. Yeah. Perception matters. It's what we talked about. That means that you have to up the standards of the people you're willing to allow in. It's not a bad thing. The Republicans had to do it when Gary Bull- Gold- uh, Barry Goldwater ran for president. They had to swear off the John Birch Society from here in Indianapolis. Addition by subtraction isn't a bad thing. That means people get butt hurt. Tell them to go start the butt hurt party. <laughs> Again, your anus doing okay? Yes, yeah, and I'm alive, awesome. I think. I uh, hope. I don't know how to tell the audience this. Uh, listen, guys, here's my plug. It is for the Gary Johnson for President and Raw Audio Politics podcast, as well as the Chris Spangle Show podcast. Uh, listen, you go to wearelibertarians.com, we got podcasts coming out of Greg's broken anus. I mean, it's, it's significant how many podcasts we, we have. Uh, podcast leakage, really. It, it, there's a lot of <laughs> podcast leakage. We have a fissure of podcasts. Um, Why we, do I come on the show again? Don't we know. don't, but we appreciate it. So thank you all for coming on and uh, for legitimizing you guys a little well, bit. I mm-hmm. just, I, you thought you'd have picked up on this addition by subtraction thing. I think every <laughs> opportunity to not come. We, you know? we've been, so look where your look where your voluntary association got you, Brett. We've been politely asking you to leave the party and the country the whole episode. <laughs> Go back to where you came from. Uh, Georgia. Georgia. No, you look way swarthier than Georgia. Oh, Poland? Poland. You got a little Polish oh, in you. Oh, no. Let him out. We've lived this nightmare. The anti-Semitism <laughs> episode. <laughs> <laughs> where Brett's talking about his family heritage and Chris is... Wearing mocking me, yeah. Adolf did nothing wrong t shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. We're talking about the time my grandfather spent yeah. in the concentration camp, and, and I said, My Chris too. is over there farting and carrying on. <laughs> I said, Listen, my father, my grandfather died in a concentration camp. How fell out of the guard tower? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nazi humor. Yeah, all right, three, two, one. Always away. See, it's already happening. Everything I've talked about is already <laughs> happening right in this room. I'm sorry, that was offensive. I know it. It's an old joke. I'm not anti-Semitic. No. I love the Jews. <laughs> At Passover's next week, I will be smearing Tim's blood on my door. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Dark turn. You not racist. Uh, all right. <laughs> it's, always, it's always color with your turns, I swear. Uh, my plug is for our podcast. We've got a bunch of different podcasts. Uh, my lovely girlfriend, Emily Buley, who is... 20. The, 
20, and the smartest girl I know, she and I are going to start doing something on the Chris Spangle Show podcast. Uh, the Gary Johnson and Raw Audio podcast will have the audio of the, the debates that are coming up. Uh, you can hear a bunch of different stuff. If you have uh, things that you'd like to hear, the, the interviews that you think are relevant, um, you know, within the, within the confines of what I can do in terms of copyright law, uh, then I will put that in the Raw Audio Politics feed. Check those out, please. Uh, and we're going to have a couple, I've got a couple other ideas. I've got some cool ideas. Uh, a podcast with Abdul that we're thinking about doing, teaching you the rules of politics a la Tammany Hall. Uh, and then a Libertarian 101 podcast, I think. So we'll, we'll see. Lots of ideas. want to hear your suggestions, what you'd like to hear, what you need, what problems can we solve for you. Uh, let us know. And listen, if you have a dick pic, please send it to Tim McGuire. Thank you for joining us on this episode of We Likes Him in Text. He does. He loves texting. I do love texting. He does. Uh, and if you're a lady, let's not discriminate. Send him some send him some boobies, because everybody loves boobies. Thank you for joining us on We Are Libertarians this week. As always, we promise to do better next time. I did it. Alright. <laughs>